Chapter 32 In the news again today, more planar rips in Europe. A summit is being held next week to address responses to this rising threat, and the OMO is expected to attend. However, no one seems to have an answer other than throwing more mages at the rips. The United States is by far the least affected, mostly due to the efforts of one Merlin, Coruscant Monroe. CNN Mage Focus Okay, I said, drawing it out. Does it affect anything that is going on right now? Shay stood and shrugged. He stared at it for another minute, then drained the coffee. Maybe, maybe not. We won't know until we get in there. You ready? Where before he'd been reluctant, now he looked like he was about to start bouncing in place with excitement. I gave Seat Lolly, who'd mostly been quiet, a look. She shrugged. Might as well. Fine. Follow me when I say it is clear. If I say stop, stop. Caroline's voice was more discordant, almost jangly. He stepped into the rip. I stood there, waiting, unable to breathe. When he created rips, I could see where I was going. This was like looking into a swirl of something that pulled at my heart and threatened to rend my mind. Enter, he said, and I closed my eyes and walked through. Every other rip I'd been in felt like stepping across a threshold, sometimes into the heat or cold, but most of the time it was oddly neutral. This time it felt like what I'd imagine a sea of sticky caramel to feel like. It pushed against me, trying to pull me under, and then refused to let me move. And that was the physical. Mentally, it was like talking to Bob and Salstra, but muffled and seductive. I kept leaning forward, trying to listen to what I could almost hear, even as I pulled back because of the pain. The last step through, I stumbled, my knees threatening to buckle as I was freed from the in-between. The three of us stood there, panting and shaky, while the two familiars watched us. I told you this was not wise, but still, better this than order. I breathed in, and the scents of rich flowers, jungle, wet, and moss surrounded me to the point I almost choked on it. Shaking off my disorientation, I looked around, letting my eyes focus on something other than Kessis and Kirlian. It took three passes to make sense of what my eyes told me, and even then, I'm pretty sure what I saw was what my mind could create comparisons to. Kind of. If you took the jungles of Hawaii, dumped them into the swamps of Louisiana, then added an active volcano and traveling boulders, you might have a general idea that wouldn't even be close to what we stood in. Wetness seeped into my shoes as my feet steamed. The water is hot, I said, still staring at my feet and the mud that was baking around them. Yes, this is a chaos realm. Nothing is orderly. The sarcasm in Carolyn's tone snapped me back to some logic. Oh, yeah. I scrambled up to the log to where Carolyn and Kessis were. The thick mud dropping off my boots with sickening plops. Seat Lolly joined me up there, but Shay was poking at the boulders, muttering to himself. Are they what you thought they were? I asked as I tried to clean the mud off my shoes. Yes, but maybe a new formation. This is fascinating. Is this a realm or area we can get back to? I didn't realize that the realms had geological activity. He didn't look at us as he spoke, still busy poking at the rocks. Possibly. Depends on how magically stable the region is. Not very would be my guess since we are here because of the rips. Caroline's voice was so without inflection it hurt. Shay flinched and moved toward us. Yes, point. He clambered up with us, looking around. So what are we looking for, anyhow? I shrugged. Not a clue. Something to show why this is ripping here? I looked around. From this side, you could see the bridge and the police cars arrayed around us. Odd. We can see from this area, but not in. Something from my physics class tickled the back of my mind. 
Is it just me, or does this kind of remind you of how collapsed stars are thought to work? Everything being a single direction? Seat Lolly shrugged. That isn't anything I have training in, but I can ask our scientists and researchers. Shay tilted his head. It's been a long time, but if I follow that, you were saying something exploded here, and that is why it is a one-way view? Maybe. I wasn't positive, but it seemed viable. A long hair raising howl set up in the distance, and we all turned. My heart pounded as we looked. What was that? Most likely more of the creatures that were killed outside. There are probably hunting grounds. I smell many small creatures. It is an area rich in creatures to eat. I nodded. It meant we needed to move fast. Let me see if I can close it from this side. My magic reached out to feel along the rip. It was odd. From the other side, it felt like a zipper with teeth that needed to interlace. Here, it was different. The magic pressed against it, wanting to escape, to find someplace new. The pressure of it ebbed and surged. My mind twisted, feeling it out, trying to figure it out. Shay, is there anything you can see that might have caused the rip? You said those stones are pretty unique. He jumped off the log, ignoring the squelch of mud as he hit. Let me look. He began to poke around, humming under his breath. Seat Lolly, do you know anything? The howls were getting closer. That there is a hunting pack headed our way, and all of us except Caroline will be regarded as easy prey. She had a knife in her hands and was facing the jungle around us. I might have been more worried, but her wide grin told me she was looking forward to it. In other words, no. I sighed and looked around. There were so many plants, rocks, moss, mud, grass, and decaying vegetation that I had zero idea what I was even looking at. But what I didn't see were any signs of an explosion in the vicinity. If there had been a disruption, I couldn't see any evidence. Maybe there wasn't anything to see. I froze, thinking, or nothing humans could see. Carolyn? I asked, turning to look at him. He was focused on the trees behind us, and even I could see shuffling shapes in there. An ear flicked back at me. Can you see magic? This garnered a full head turn, then back to his prey. Not how you mean. If you were asking, are there signs of an explosion that are not visible to human eyes? Maybe, but it is more along the lines of gas bursting into flames when a match nears it. Glorious destruction, little evidence. He lowered down, only the tip of his tail twitching. The incident he referenced was Marisol one day, back at her house in Georgia, had been talking too much when she went to ignite her gas burner. The automatic pilot light had gone out ages ago, and as a fire mage, it wasn't any effort for her to start a spark. It whooshed up, creating a huge flame and singeing her eyebrows. He'd been properly impressed with the ferocity of the stove for months afterward. Huh. So, maybe magic pools up and explodes when something ignites it? I muttered mostly to myself. You know, that might explain this and why the stones are growing into the rip in our world, Shay said. That shook me out of my mental wanderings. What? So these stones... We've always thought they collected minerals from the water and it caused a swelling effect that enabled them to grow, and even more to a certain extent. But if there was an explosion of magic and it fed into those trovins, even as it ripped through the fabric of reality, then that might explain everything. Explain everything what? I walked down the log toward him, but didn't step back into the warm mud. Hamadi was going to be upset regardless. Why they move and grow even on Earth. This has already grown since we've been here. It's amazing. I'd never seen Shay this excited about anything. It was a new look. You need to close the rip quickly. The packs are coming, and you're not fighters. Carolyn's voice cut into our discussion, and I turned to see that he had disappeared. He's a cat. He's hunting. The reminder didn't stop the spurt of worry as I stared at where he'd been. They aren't, but Kessis and I are. Seat Lolly turned to look at me. 
You and Shay work on the rip, and I'll help with the enemies in coming. As she said the words, she dropped off the log and all but vanished, Kessis right behind her. The words of don't go and be safe caught in my throat. They would not be appreciated or wanted. Instead, I turned to Shay. You heard them. We need to get this closed, and I can't with the rocks in the way. Trovins, he corrected. But I know this geological structure. I can fracture it. Once it is broken, pushing or pulling it through shouldn't be hard. You think you can close it after that? I checked what was blocking the rip. A bit of dirt and mud. But mostly, it was the rocks, growing ever thicker. Yes, and the faster, the better. A howl, a hiss, and a strangled cry sounded behind me. I started to turn, needing to see what was going on. No, focus on your job. Trust him. Trust them. It ranked up there with some of the hardest things I've ever done. Not turning and rushing to help. The sounds of battle filled the air behind us. Yelps, snarls, growls, and most disturbing, the random laugh from Seat Lolly. Shay had wide eyes as he gazed behind me. Stop it. We can't help. Start breaking and I'll start closing. He bobbed his head up and down, his face going paler. But to his credit, he turned and began to use magic at what seemed an exorbitant rate. His long braids were vaporizing as he moved. I almost said something, but the stones that were blocking the way were splitting in half. This I could help with. The more education you got, the more finesse you had. It seemed like I could never learn enough, but brute strength I was experienced at using. With a tug on earth, which was sluggish to respond, I rocked the ground in front of the rip and flipped the broken stones either forward onto the bridge or back away from blocking anything. Oh yes, magic is at play. Even where I broke pieces off of them, they are growing fast enough. I can see it. Shay was poking at a trovin again. Shay, now is not the time. Oh, yeah. He went back to breaking. At least he was cutting them a good foot from the wall, but the sounds were getting louder. Koi, while this is great fun, the numbers are becoming more than we can easily handle. It might be a good idea to speed this up. Carolyn's voice was conversational, but given how easily I'd seen him carve through things before, I knew he meant it. You clear, Shay? I yelled as the battle sounds were even louder, and I was constantly flinching and struggling not to turn and race toward Carolyn. I think so. Try it now, he called as he stepped back away from the tear. I grabbed the rip and started to press it together. Oddly, when the edges got close enough, it was like a magnetic pull, and they started to snap together as I pushed. It cost me so little compared to what I had been fighting with. With a mental snap, the gaping wound in reality disappeared and revealed more of the odd jungle and bubbling hot spring not a hundred yards away. This place makes no geological sense. I love it. I'd never seen Shay with his eyes shining. Yep, but we aren't staying. Carolyn, it's closed. I yelled the words as I turned, hunting for his ruby red coat in the jungle swamp. Opening now. Get through it. A slice of pain, and I glanced over my shoulder to see a long, vertical rip waiting for me, the bridge on the other side. Not without you, I said, standing there. A roar shook the air, and I heard trees fall. Carolyn? Seat Lale came booking out of the greenery she disappeared in. She was spattered with blood and had a huge smile on her face while Kessis ran beside her. Time to go! Yep, I'm gone, Shay said. I started to walk backward, unwilling to leave without Carolyn. Corey, come on. No, he has to come with us. Corey, Seat Lale said, exasperated. He'll be right behind us. Now come on. I didn't turn around, though I took a few more steps backwards until I could feel it at my back. Carolyn? A flash of ruby red caught my eye and I focused on the calf racing at me at top speed. I smiled at that sight, then froze as I caught sight of what was behind him. It looked like a cross between a rhino and a bear, teeth, horns, 
gleaming eyes and a tough furry hide that I wasn't sure a bazooka would get through. Go! Now! The force of his words pushed me through the rip, even as he sprang through, the tear sealing as the creature rushed us, surrounded by the same things the police had killed earlier. I landed on my back on the bridge, with Carolyn standing over me, panting. You do not listen to orders well, my queen. He licked my cheek with a bloody tongue. Ew! I rubbed at the blood. It reeked. Next time, listen. I would not leave you so easily. He stepped off and let me get a good look. To my relief, I could only see a cut across his nose. Most of the blood seemed to be other creatures, as nothing was seeping out. That doesn't mean I'm ever going to leave you. I pushed myself to my feet, groaning a bit. I landed on some of the rock bits I'd tossed out of the way. Using his strength to steady me, I turned to see cops from both sides of the bridge staring at me. And now I get to try to explain what happened. With a sigh, I made my way over to the man headed for me, while Shay picked up rocks, putting them in the pouch he made of his shirt. Seatlali was checking on Kessis with that same smile on her face. She must have felt me watching her as she looked up and grinned. That was fun. Can we do it again? I just groaned and went to deal with the political issues. Chapter 33 In a twist, Cory Monroe helped save a city in Mexico. While she is jumping around the U.S. closing rips, other countries don't have her. In a plea from one of the Mexican teams, she got on a Zoom call so she could see the rip. Corey provided advice and some tips to help them get the rip closed, as well as deal with the creatures coming out of it. The question many people are still asking is... What happens when we lose her? Is this a hint of what the apocalypse will be? Talking Head, CNN, Mage Focus. I ended up dealing with Yolanda and Stephen and soothing Caroline's stress on Thursday. The two government employees, no, I wasn't happy with them, demanded details about the other side of the rip and how we managed to close it. While I was completely honest with them, I might have overstated the danger to convince them that this wasn't the correct option for most rips. Carolyn showing them his teeth and then stating that he had to run convinced them that wasn't a good idea. Especially after I sent an image of the thing that had come for us at the last. Yolanda was green and Stephen pale. I had to fight not to smirk. As for Carolyn... That involved me going to a realm under his mother's control with a large, shady tree, a natural spring, and lots of rabbits for him to chase while I didn't move. It wasn't that hard to convince me. It was quiet and gave me time to create my game plan. The next order of business was memory stones. Some were easy, some weren't, and I had more than I wanted to go through. By the time Thursday was done, Caroline was stuffed and exhausted, and I knew the only way to deal with the stones was to jump in. I never really cataloged them, so I'd do it as I went. Friday morning, a large thermos of high-calorie Mexican coffee, three queso pollos chimichangas, my water bottle, and a bag of salt and vinegar potato chips were arranged in my office. I'd set up the big bean bag that we usually use downstairs so I could lounge in it as I accessed the memories. Plus, a blanket. It was starting to warm into spring, but the house wasn't hot enough that a blanket would be too much. I still got cold easily. I headed into the memento room with a basket and stared at the collection. Carolyn had followed me in. He was still in mothering mode after the rip adventure. Carolyn, is it possible some of the other things might be memory stones? I looked at the collection of things and cringed. Nothing of organic material. No feathers, eggs, or wood can hold memories. They are too fluid. You need a stronger structure. That made me feel a bit better. It still seemed more than I wanted. The two remaining statues seemed to glower at me. I really needed to find another request for Tursane and get these creepy things out of here. 
I'll just try them all, I guess. Instead of the slow, methodical selection, I just grabbed everything vaguely rock or crystal-like and dumped it in the basket. By the time I was done, my wicker basket was groaning, and the room looked barren and somewhat creepy. I stopped as I was about to walk out, staring at the obelisk. It was what Hamadia tested me with the first time I came here. Hamadia? I asked, my eyes not leaving the stone. Yes, Corey. She spoke from the doorway, not entering the room. Now that I thought about it, I'd never really seen her in here, though she'd been in every other room, including the bathroom while I was using the toilet. That had been an interesting discussion with her deciding human biology was horribly inefficient. I agreed. What is the obelisk? I remember melting it, but it reformed. Magic and hematite? She said with a shrug. Is it a memory stone? I had looked back at it. This time she froze, eyes locked on mine, then tilted her head inhumanly far back, staring at the ceiling. If it is, it is from the time of the Nephilim, before humans learned to make use of magic. That bit of information let me know I absolutely was not going to check and see. Got it. No way does it have any information about Atlantis on it. I would not think so. That was gone from the realms way before the undoing, she said as she spun. My body locked. The dryads. I never asked them. Himadia, you don't know about the undoing, do you? She laughed, her mostly green teeth flashing. No, I am a tree that has a lifespan of a few hundred years, not thousands. My eyes widened. Are there any trees that have dryads that have been around for thousands of years? I do not know. Most of us that are that old are all petrified. We retreat to our protective trees and rarely come out. Besides, you would need one that still grew on Earth, not the realms. And I know of no seeds or saplings that survived. She frowned as if thinking. I will ask, but do not think I will find answers. Even if seeds or saplings lived... They would not remember what they were not there for. I sagged. She had told me how long it took before saplings awoke. It would have been years after the devastation. Thank you, anyhow. I trudged back to my office, Carolyn silent beside me. I settled down to look at the stones I had. Most were semi-precious. A large opal, amethyst, a few moonstones, one of obsidian, a few cut gems two geodes, uncut, three sculptures of marble or granite, two hunks of uncut ruby, and the phoenix heart. I sighed, having grabbed it with everything else. Here goes nothing, I muttered, as Carolyn flormed on the floor next to the beanbag. I grabbed the first one, the opal with the gold running down the middle, and closed my eyes. With a sigh, I pushed my focus toward it letting the memories stored inside open up. Scenes from a Gorgon enclave filled my mind, and I swear I saw a young Tursane. I just let it play, doing the equivalent of fast-forward, looking for anything that might be worth a second glance. Luckily, it was the equivalent of home movies, so I didn't see anything that I felt embarrassed on Tursane's behalf. When I came out of the stone, I set that aside request or not, that was immediately going to Tursane. The idea of keeping it felt wrong. I randomly picked up another one, the unopened geode. I fell into the crystal that were contained in it, and it was like being hit with a photo album. Lots of little snapshots. If I had grabbed a photojournalist camera with 50 years of random shots, it might equate to this. There were pictures of creatures, old school-like scenes, Hunting, the jungles, savannas, even one or two pictures of the stars, which gave me a spurt of hope, but not much else. Even if they had been pictures of Atlantis, there wasn't anything to connect them. My head was spinning by the time I dropped it, and I groaned softly. Are you well? Caroline asked in my mind, and I sighed. <sighs> Just a headache. I found the denizen's version of a photo album. That was exhausting and ultimately useless. 
I still don't even know who fed all the images in there. It could have been a human, snake, or chaos blob. I drank some of my coffee. The chocolate ice cream melted in it, enhancing the richness. Two down, way too many to go. Do not overstress yourself. Some of those contain years of information, Carolyn warned. I would only do one more today. Probably two, unless one of them is really long. Right now, bathroom. I struggled up out of the oh-so-comfy bag and made it to the bathroom. Then I curled right back up, warmed up a chimichanga while I made notes about the two stones I'd done so far. When that was gone, I grabbed another stone. Well, actually, one of the marble statues. It was of a centaur holding a staff. The marble was white and gray, and the details made me uncomfortable. It took me a minute to sink into it. Then I was there. This was a teaching stone on what I designated as homesteading skills. Magic, yes, but more like how to wash, clean, build, repair. I skimmed through it and bounced out relatively quickly. Only 20 minutes. That was interesting. I really hope I never need to learn to spin or weave, but it is interesting. It even had things about moving large stones for protective walls. I yawned and stretched. Are you done? I checked the time. It was two in the afternoon. I was headed over to the Tudor house for dinner. I think I have time for one more. He lifted his head to check the basket. All the chimichangas were eaten, the coffee half gone, but I hadn't opened the chips yet. Very well, one more. He licked my toe. You will figure it out. And if I don't, what happens? I let my head fall back on the bag. Does everything keep breaking? I'm rather surprised the realms haven't felt anything, but given that last area, I get the feeling the ruptures are occurring outside areas where sentient denizens live. But what happens if they start doing it in populated areas? Or we fire nukes? That was my huge worry. I didn't trust any government if they got scared enough. And while I suspected they could stop a nuke with magic, that was only if they knew it was coming and had time to think or plan. Carolee moved enough to put his head on the bottom of the beanbag, and I rubbed his cheek against my foot. I do not know, but not even the seasons stay the same. You will find the right path for all of us. I fumbled in the basket for another stone, my fingers wrapped around something gold and faceted. Maybe. I just... If I fail, will there be another herald? Corey, do you have a moment? Freya's voice rang in my head before Carolyn could respond. Yes? I said, blinking my eyes. Sudden exhaustion had hit me like a wall. I thought you should know. Brix was found dead. A memory stone was left behind. I jerked up, my hands squeezing hard on the next stone. What happened? I know phoenixes aren't immortal, but they don't just die. And there aren't that many. Carolyn lifted his head to look at me as I had broadcast that thought. They are, but they can be killed. Her voice held an odd note of sorrow. As far as we can tell, Bricks refused to eat or drink since the council meeting. One of my Valkyries found the body and the stone. She took a mental pause, and I stiffened. It is addressed to humans. The amount of anger and hate in it is uncomfortable. You are blamed for the influx of magic into the realms and how you changed everyone. Changed. Terse mentioned that too, but I didn't force anyone to do anything. No, but you are such a presence that beings especially those of us sensitive to magic, alter our behavior to please you, even if we are unaware of our actions. Your presence has started to create a balance that we had not realized was missing. Freya's words weren't exactly comforting. That wasn't my intent. I started already trying to figure out what I could do, how to make amends. Stop. No, you have no intentions of being anything other than what you are. The Herald of Magic. A herald announces change, ushers in those with the power to make laws, and provides the weapons needed. You are doing all of those duties, just in ways the more literal of us never thought of. 
Your weapons are information and love. The power to make laws is the lords of both our people. You are what you should be, Cory Monroe. The herald of magic. Her firm, no-nonsense tone didn't let me argue, but it still felt wrong. Bricks wasn't supposed to die. The bad guys had to be defeated, right? Not just fade away or die. But I wasn't sure Bricks had ever been the villain, just the victim. If you say so, but I don't want any more to die. There has to be an answer, and I'm just too stupid to see it. Freya laughed. It reminded me of distant battle horns, rich and powerful. <laughs> if there is, the rest of us are blind too. At this point, we have no option but to have faith that magic will provide the answer. I hope you are right. So do I. I would have felt better if her voice had been confident, not wistful. My eyes closed as I tried to fight back the tears, but they seeped out between my lashes. Another death. I'd be laying at my feet. How did I fix this? If I was supposed to be the hero... Where were the clues leading me to the answers? Carolyn licked the side of my feet, and I clenched the stone hard enough it hurt. I let the exhaustion and grief pull me under, and I fell into a doze. Chapter 34 Office of the President What exactly does Harold mean? We've had Cory Monroe under surveillance for years, but she has avoided almost all political groups. Who is calling her the Herald, and what are the ramifications? Having someone with her power running around is like losing the codes to nukes. I want information and details ASAP. Do what you need, but we need to keep her under control, or we need a solution. Chief of Staff, K. Lewis for the President. Wind rushed through my wings as I dove through the clear blue sky. The clouds laughed at me as I swirled around and through them. My trill filled the air, calling out my delight to all the world. What are you doing, beloved? Brix's voice filled my mind, and I hummed in response. His rich voice always made me smile. Chasing the sun, awaiting the moon. I spun again my feathers trailing magic behind me as I curved. My luminous feathers caught the light, reflecting rainbows into the clouds and off the water far below. Up here you could see until the world curved away from you, and nothing existed but the eternal sky and sea. I could fly for seasons and had many times, and still I hadn't seen all the beauty of this world." The sun fears your beauty and the moon longs to be as bright as you. But I have a place I believe we could call home. Brix's voice contained a questioning note that surprised me. Brix personified assured arrogance. What would cause this unusual tone? Curiosity. My driving characteristic washed through me and I tilted some feathers to change my direction. Brix's presence shone in my mind like the stars in the unending sky. I allowed the wind to carry me closer to him as I danced across the vast expanse. The golds and reds of flame-colored feathers appeared in the distance, and I soared toward my love. My tail wrapped around bricks as I spun in a dance of joy, letting our magic wash against each other until the sun changed to match the feathers of my love as it sank around the earth. Home? What is this home you speak of? We have roamed long. Do you wish to tie to the earth instead of soar in the sky? This was a new idea, and often seasons passed where we only landed to pick the sweet berries or sip on water that bubbled from a hidden spring. Most of the time, we danced in the air and spent our lives following the clouds around the world. Why or where would you want to go? What place could have caught your imagination to the point that you would want to call it home? I let the wind ruffle my feathers around him as I waited for an answer. Bricks ducked under my wing, letting red feathers mix with my rainbow white as we created a painting in the sky. After a few dances in the sky, he provided an answer to my query. 
but words were not what I expected. You had mentioned a while ago about raising another clutch of eggs. Is that something you still want to do? In surprise, my wings faltered, and a sudden downdraft caught me unawares, and I spun in the air, looking at him, my golden eyes shining with both surprise and excitement. Are you serious? Is that what you wish to do? To leave our chase of the seasons and raise young once again? I recovered, but I allowed the earth to pull me toward her. Bricks fluttered after me, following me in a long, lazy spiral towards the waves cresting below. Before my fears could grow or the waves reach us, Bricks elaborated. Yes, I think it is time. Our one child was a long time ago, and I would like to try again. Maybe this time have a better relationship with any hatchlings that we are blessed with. Perhaps this time it will go better. I would love to see your eyes in a chick with my feathers. Joy burst through me, giving my feathers a halo of color as I spread my wings and let the wind pick me up and throw me back into the skies. Bricks followed, weaving in my wake as I danced my joy around the clouds and down through the spray of the ocean. Yes, I would like hatchlings. Where is this place you think we could make a home of? It is but a day's journey towards the rising sun. This land is full of berries, honey, thick trees, and fresh water. There are those odd things, humans. I think that is what the name was. They live there, but they are magic users. I've stopped and talked to them before. They seem friendly, and we can always call magic if needed. His words tumbled around my brain, bringing images with them. Full, dark berries, honey dripping from hives, trees with thick branches, and amusing two legs to watch. It sounded like it might work. Well, they hunt us. Most creatures worried about being prey, while we were small enough to not be much to settle a hunger, even among the other magical beings, our feathers were prized. I think not, but our feathers are of use for trade, plus my stashes of sparkles. That comment almost caused a disruption in my flying. You would raid your collection? Bricks collected sparkles, anything that caught the light and shone with a hidden radiance he had collected— creating a treasure trove. When we found things we needed, we could trade for them, sometimes for much, others for little. But we had the air and the sky. We had little need for other things. Locusts were fat and tasty, fruit hung off trees, and even honey could be gained for the price of a few stings. For a nest with you, full of chicks, I would give them all up. You are my life, she do you not think I would do anything for you? The trill of honesty, love, devotion made everything sweeter. I wrapped my wings around him, and we made it there, in the boundless sky with the hope for eggs, offspring, new lives in this world. Together, we pushed our magic out into the world, and we focused on celebrating life. Days later, we floated on a warm breeze above the ocean, my tail feathers almost orange in the light of the setting sun behind me. A landmass was in front of us. Lush trees, wide bays full of their little wooden floats, and the scents of honey, a sharp spice, and human waste. I sighed. Even after all this time, humans still had not managed the disposal of their refuse. We should teach them the spells to transform waste to plant food, this manner of disposal smells and is a waste of resources. I chittered annoyed. The smell and piles could spoil a paradise, and this looked as close as I'd ever seen. Then why do we not? It would raise our value to them and create a working relationship that we can build over the years. Bricks always sounded logical and calm where I went with my emotions, always ready to shift with the wind. We flew closer and I inspected the place from afar. Did I want to settle down here? Phoenix hatchlings were not like normal birds with a month or two of growth and then done. It would take them at least three years to be fully feathered and able to ash if badly injured. It meant a safe place, 
and the need to have food and shelter. It was unlikely we had started a family with our mating. That had just been for fun. We had a better chance of quickening life if done during times when magic surged. The longest day, the longest night, or best of all, when the sun ate the moon, or the moon ate the sun. If we made it then, our children would be strong and have the opportunity to grow into amazing beings. But first, I needed a nest. The closer we got, the more I saw. Square caves dotted the land with fires coming out of them, and lines. Everything was made up of straight lines, rigid lines of grapes, trees, paths. Even their houses were created around ungiving lines. It felt odd and somehow wrong. Few things in the world were done in harsh lines. I missed the shapes where you never knew what was next. A curve, a sharp turn, maybe a wiggling line. My thoughts escaped me as a soft trill that Brooks did not miss. You do not like. I do not know. We must meet, talk. There are many of these humans here. If they are not friendly, I would rather the mountains, the trees and animals of the forest. Telling him my fears would only bring facts and figures. They were not what I wanted at this point. There would be less rich food, harder to raise chicks. There was the logic that I did not care about. True, but safer away from those sharp sticks they throw in the air with all too high of an ability to hit. I could reply with logic as well as he, but a home had very little to do with logic. Bricks did not respond, instead tilted heading toward a cave that reached far into the sky, but this one felt warmer and welcoming. There were no lines, Everything was made up of curves from the roof to the sides to the holes to go in. There were gentle curves that invited magic to play. I landed on the top of the building, my talons wrapping around the frills and the covering. It was painted with blues and greens, and it had looked like the ocean from above. Beneath us was magic bubbling around, full of promise and possibilities. This place is rich in many things, but what about the ones that live here? Bricks ruffled feathers and rubbed his beak along my wing. I have spoken to many of these humans, but there are others like us. A centaur lives on the other side and teaches many of their children. Dolphins hunt fish with them and are happy with their generosity. There are some naga in the caves below, and the alaras visit from their islands across the bay. I let my wings fully collapse to my side, no longer holding them ready to flee. That is good to know. They have a person who leads the worship in magic. She is the one I have spoken with. Brick scanned the area while I considered those words. They worship magic? Why? A trill of laughter filled the air, and I let myself join in, the music of our voices creating its own type of magic. Around the area, there was a slowing and stopping as humans paused to listen. A few spotted us on the roof, from their pointing arms to the harsh mouth noises, but no one came rushing to chase us away. When we let the desire to sing fade, something laughter often caused, we continued to survey the area. I have no idea why they worship magic, but it is plentiful. Maybe they think we'll teach them better ways to use it. If so, then we are here at her best. Either way, they can be foolish. It matters not to me. I let the words sway me. After all, if they wish to worship the moon, magic, or the distant lights in the sky, it mattered not to me. There. It is the woman I wish to have you meet. Will you? Brix's eyes held an odd mix of hope and a please. Why would I not? Let us speak with this female. I sprang into the air, my white feather reflecting rainbows as I let myself burn off a bit of energy. Then I followed him. Bricks headed to a woman wearing coverings of white and brown, but there were hints of blue and red at the borders. It was not an unpleasant covering, if confusing. Humans always seemed to be covered, even when the weather did not require it. We landed on a low wall that put us uncomfortably close to a human's grasp. 
but Briggs did not seem concerned. The female looked up at us, and she bared her teeth suddenly. I pulled back, ready to flee, but Briggs whispered in my mind, That is how they say welcome. Let it be. I forced myself to settle back down, but I managed to hit Briggs with my primary wing feathers as I did so. Flame Feather, you have returned, and you bring with you a friend of moonlight. The voice was soft and oddly melodious, as if she sang constantly. It helped me relax a little. I did, Lenia. May I present my mate, Shira? Bricks tilted his head toward me, and I nodded, still ready to flee. These humans could become violent in but a moment. Ah, I am honored. May I present my daughter, Zenobia? She placed her hand on the child who looked at us, eyes wide with wonder. Chapter 35 In the sleepy town of Ostel G.A., the head of local HOA woke up this morning to find his house surrounded by the endangered Saracenaceae plants. The head, Harold Lavick, swears it is mage Ben Griff who did this, The person in question was fined for the plants he has around his house and is an earth mage. He allegedly swore he'd get revenge. Right now, Harold is in violation of the HOA rules for plants, but because they are endangered plants and the state forbids any disturbance of them, even mowing the area around the plants is prohibited. KWSC Local News I jerked up in the beanbag, something clenched tight in my hand to the point it hurt. If I'd been in a chair, I would have gotten hurt trying to spring to my feet. As it was, all I could do was look around, feeling unhinged. Corey, what is wrong? Carolyn asked, looking at me. Did you dream? I took a shuddering breath in and then out. That wasn't a dream. The phoenix heart is a memory stone of Shira. I said, but that wasn't right. Or me? I was Shira. I should go fly some more so I can sort out my mind. My hand trembled as I reached for my water. The longing to be in the sky, to feel the wetness of clouds against my beak was a physical desire. A few long gulps of cold water helped to center me and get me back to being Cory, a human. That was intense. Odd that it pulled you in so far. What sort of memory? Why does Shira sound familiar? He moved around the bag, licking my cheek as I settled back down. She was the spouse of Bricks. Her memory of Bricks is of a kinder bird, someone who didn't hate or fear humans. The depth of the betrayal Bricks must have felt was registering. These weren't humans who had randomly destroyed the building he lived in, but friends. I couldn't imagine that but the fear that spiked through me told me I needed human interaction. It would be dangerous to dive back in right now. The stone warmed in my hand as I thought about them, pushing the feeling of soaring through the air into my mind. I lifted my watch up and had to blink a few times to figure out the time was four in the afternoon. Yeah, people. The kids should be home, and isolating here was the worst thing I could do. I'm struggling to figure out who and where I am. The world spun around me as I focused on my body. I frowned at my cup of chocolate, but I couldn't come up with a memory of me putting alcohol in it. Carolyn, can you ask Sable to come get me for dinner? I think I need that. I didn't move from the beanbag. My wings were still missing, and their lack confused me. Was the world always this blah with colors? He hissed and was gone. Carolyn? He had been there, right? My bladder imposed on me its demands, and I didn't think I could empty it safely via magic right now. That meant walking. I rolled out of the beanbag, once again grateful it lay so close to the ground, and began to crawl to the bathroom. One hand, then a knee. No, the other knee. Corey, what's wrong? Marisol's voice surprised me, and I almost fell over as I tried to look at her and move simultaneously. It didn't work well. 
My wings are broken. I should fly. Why can't I fly? The words sounded wrong, and I could see my arms. But shouldn't they be wings? Oh my, come on, get up, Cory. You need to use the bathroom? Marisol slipped one arm around my waist and helped me stand up. You're strong. It surprised me she could do that. She shouldn't be able to lift me with ease. Should she? No, you're light. Bathroom, then we're going to my house. She had the stern, no-nonsense tone that told me fighting her would not be wise. Okay, I murmured as my memories fought between running on two legs and flying with wings. Before I could formulate my objection, I was at Marisol's craftsman house. She wrapped me in a blanket, handed me pureed chicken soup, and a bottle of water filled with electrolytes and sugar. Eat, drink, then we'll talk. She watched my every move, and I didn't even think of disobeying. My head wobbled like it wasn't attached all the way. Images of my head floating away into the clouds lasted until I had the soup gone, and most of the drink. The memories were fading, and I realized Kirlian had his head on my lap, tail twitching, while Marisol was in the chair across from me. Um, hi. I swallowed, verifying I knew where I was. That was odd. Marisol set down her book and looked at me. Care to tell me what happened? If you had been one of my sons, I would have assumed you were experimenting with recreational drugs. Gah, no. Not right now. It's a memory stone. One I absolutely have to go back into. It is the memory of the spouse of Bricks, the one who died with their chicks. I don't know how far it goes, but it's amazing what I've learned so far. I paused and thought about what I'd seen. It at least soothed my feelings towards Bricks. The love between them was borderline magical. Then what was all that about? Marisol waved her hand. A shrug slipped out because, to be honest, I wasn't positive what that had been. A rebound effect, I guess. I thought I was fine. Then when I moved, my mind got confused as to whether I was a bird or a human. That made it very hard to function. The world didn't even look the same anymore. I sighed. And I still need to go back. There is more. She just met Zenobia. It is the closest thing to a clue I've found. Kirlian hissed, and I didn't blame him, but he didn't argue. There didn't seem to be an option. Not right now, you aren't. And not while you are alone, Marisol said sternly. Tomorrow is Saturday. We will arrange with Joe and Sable for you to be watched. There's no way we can risk that again. What if I hadn't been here? The desire to shrug and just mutter something about figuring it out was overwhelming. But I nodded instead, still working on accepting that they loved me. I know. I just never expected that level of disorientation. I get that everyone wants to keep me safe, but people are dying. And if I'm too scared to do anything, more people are going to die. Marisol's lips thinned out as she looked down, but she didn't argue. Instead, she verified with Joe and Sable what dinner time was going to be and what she should bring. More and more, we were having big dinners together. Chris and Sanchez even asked Carolyn to get them occasionally. Chris was still upset, but he'd caught up in all of his classes. I didn't know how to help him, so I didn't pry. He knew I'd drop everything for him if he asked. And right now, that was all I could do. We settled down for dinner. The twins were sitting on opposite ends of the table. That was odd, as they usually sat next to each other, talking and feeding their ketzos, little tidbits. The dragons were at what everyone said would be their full growth for a while. They were about two feet long, their colors vibrant and their personalities much closer to the kids than the formless food pits they had been. As Mir thought when the kids hit their late teens, growth spurts, they might gain another foot and a few more pounds, but that was a ways off. But the twins had been growing like weeds. It seemed like every time I saw them, which was daily, they'd grown another inch. They would start first grade in September, and both looked like they might be the biggest kids there. What is up with you two? I had sat down in between them, 
and looked at them one at a time. Maine stole the first friend I made. I'm not talking to him. Jazz spat out the words, her fist tight around her fork. I did not. She just wanted to play trucks with us. You didn't, he protested, though he looked miserable. Oh, why didn't you want to play? I asked Jazz, flicking my attention between the two of them. Jazz might be a princess, but she did enjoy playing with cars sometimes. Last time Bobby dumped sand down my shirt. She wouldn't look at him or me, instead glared at her empty plate. Carrie was playing fashion show with me, but Maine came over and asked if she wanted to play cars in the sandbox. The trials and tribulations of a kid. It seemed so far away, but I didn't remember this sort of stuff. I was being nice. She was new. Maine was getting upset, his lower lip coming out. You're supposed to be nice. But she was playing with me. You just don't want me to have friends. There were hidden sobs in the words. You can have friends, but can't they be my friends too? Both of them now had bottom lips out and were staring so hard at the table, I was surprised it hadn't caught fire. You have friends, she protested, her head jerking up. Bobby and the other boys, even Laurel and Becca, like to eat lunch with you. I don't have anyone. Tears were welling up on her lashes, and her lip trembled. Oh, Jazz. I scooted my chair over and wrapped an arm around her. I don't have an answer, but I bet Carrie will play with you tomorrow, and Maine can play with Bobby. I shot him a look, waiting until he looked up to darken my glare. He hunched his shoulders and nodded. But if she says she wants to play cars, why don't you play too? I can't promise Bobby won't dump sand on you. I can promise he will be in big trouble. And Maine won't get to go over to his house for two weeks if he does. Maine's head jerked up. Wait, why can't I see him if he does it? Because I don't want you associated with someone that would treat your sister like that. Why would you want to be friends with someone that would do that to your sister? The crease on his forehead as he considered this heartened me. Jazz gave another sniff. Okay, I'll try again tomorrow. I kissed the top of her head. Good. I looked up as Sable walked in from the kitchen, and Joe came in from the rest of the house. Joe smiled at us and headed for the table. Sorry, long day at work, she said, then pulled Sable into her arms and kissed her. Mmm, hello, Joe. Sable purred back. Your mom will be here in a minute, and it's Friday. Yay, beer! Anyone else want something? Joe kissed Sable again. I know what you want. Not in front of the kids, Sable said with a grin. I meant to drink, woman. I'm not that much of a pervert. Joe protested, laughing. Yes, you are, I corrected. But no thanks. I think I'm on water today and this weekend. Both of them stopped and glanced at me. Something we should know? Yep, but let's eat first. I waved at the set table and the kids who were perking up a bit, their pouts fading. Fifteen minutes later, everyone settled down, plates filled with food, and we started sharing our day. Sable was working on more flow designs. Her last one had been patented. Her company gave her a nice six-figure bonus check for that, so they had been talking about an RV or a nice vacation. As far as I knew, nothing had been decided. Joe was still working for a local specialty machine shop, but there were plans in the works for her to open her own custom motorcycle shop. Something she'd always wanted. Marisol had a date next week, and, well, the kids were sniping at each other a bit more than usual, and both of them seemed like they were on the verge of tears multiple times during dinner. That wasn't like them. Maybe they were getting sick. I'd mention it later. So, tell us about your day and what is preventing any adult fun. Joe waggled her eyebrows at me, and I rolled my eyes in response. I don't have adult fun. Too, ew. The three women snickered at me, and I just shook my head. No, I had an interesting experience with a memory stone. I spent a good five minutes sharing what it had been like. That sounds fascinating, Sable admitted. 
but the after effects don't sound as appealing. I know, but I have to go back in. This time with someone around to watch me. So if anything weird happens, someone is there. Yes. You sure you're up for it tomorrow? Sable had her hand entwined with Joe's on the table, a worried look on her face. Probably not, but going to do it anyhow. At this point, every moment is too long. Part of me wanted to rush back and do it now, but even I could admit to needing longer to recover. Chapter 36 The Secretary of State and the Senate Chair, as well as the Ambassador to the UN, met with delegates from the AIN today. We received word that four people from the AIN would be coming to meet today, and here we have video of them entering the White House. At this time, no information on their names or what was discussed has been released, but this is the first confirmed meeting with the U.S. heads of state since the 1800s. CNN, Mage Focus. Saturday morning, I felt like the actor of a one-person show, with everyone else helping to manage me. The kids made sure I had their blankets to cuddle into, because they wanted me to know they would be there. Joe had cleared a space in the living room, looking out the balcony in back so I could nestle into the beanbag. Sable had created a little feast for me if I needed, while Marisol positioned herself with her laptop, so if I spoke or wanted to talk, I could tell her. It also allowed her to monitor me. I think you are all overreacting. While I'm in the stone, I doubt I'll be aware of anything. It's when I come out that the issue starts. My protests fell on deaf ears, or at least hearts that cared more about my well-being than my protests. That's nice, me, Iha. I'll be here anyway. I can ask you questions as soon as you wake up and I'll record it, just in case your brain starts to confuse the memories after you wake up. Marisol just smiled at me and sat with her own Mexican coffee. Okay, okay. Carolian, you're the only one I haven't heard from. Are you good with this? He had been sulking near the doors to the balcony and laid his ears back and hissed. <sighs> no, this is not good. It is not something I like. But I agree it is important. And even more, you would not rest if you didn't. So you will do this and I will complain. I cannot protect you in the stones. So do not get hurt. His tail flicked back and forth like a rattler. But his hiss had faded. I can get hurt in a memory stone? That shocked me. How could you get hurt in a memory? Joe and Sable, who were lurking behind me, gave twin oofs of surprise. Physically, no, but there exists the possibility of psychic and emotional trauma. Remember what it felt like to fly? If she were imprinted as deeply as I suspected she did, you will feel everything. I doubt you can do anything other than be fully immersed, but remember that they are not your emotions, not your sorrow. Oh, I murmured, turning it over in my head. Shira loved Bricks with her whole heart. It had softened my attitude toward him because of the different way she saw him. That is valid. I will try to remember. Though I had no idea how you healed from someone else's sorrow. Joe and Sable were doing their silent talk thing when I glanced back at them. Stop it. I'll be fine, you two. I understand grief. With her arms crossed over her chest, Joe huffed at me. You better not explode with magic again. This is a new carpet and expensive. I love you too, I said, smirking at her. She made faces at me until the kids, who were sitting on the couch watching all of this avidly, started giggling. I told them it would just look like I was asleep, but they didn't care. They were going to guard Mama Cory, and that was all there was to it. I made faces at everyone, took the phoenix heart, and settled down closing my eyes. I hoped it would be less immersive if I didn't fall asleep holding it. With a final mental bracing, I pushed myself into it, searching and waiting. And nothing. I kept trying, pushing all the things that worked with all the other stones, and it sat in my hand like an inanimate jewel. I don't understand, I said, opening my eyes to see everyone staring at me. I can't get in, and I know there's more in there. 
No one had moved in the ten minutes I'd been trying, though the twins were busy with their ketzos. They both had found little vests from a doll set, and the silly dragons loved them. Didn't you say Jorges had wanted to talk to you about it when you first got it? Sable said, leaning against the wall. Why not ask him? He said something about it being used to channel energy, not being a memory stone. But I might as well. I cleared my mind. Georgas, are you able to come talk to us? I struggled out of the bag and dropped into a chair. Talking to people was easier when you didn't look like a candidate for milk and cookies. A poof of flame. Kuri, he said, looking around with wings still ready to fly away. This is a new place. Joe, this is your house. Well, ours in Zelinka's when she matures, but yes. How are you? Joe had her normal smile. There was something just so disarming about the bird. Curious, as always. What prompts this? Questions? Information? For the first time, I translated his interest not as a willingness to serve or even a need to help, but gather gossip to spread. I wasn't sure whether to laugh or scold him, so I ignored that aspect. Georgas, this, the phoenix heart, what is it exactly? He tilted his head, his red feathers flickering around him. The phoenix haunt, as I said. He sounded confused, and I tried to put my questions into something more specific. Right. James said it was a way to focus magic, amplify. But what else is it? I just assumed it was a faceted gem, maybe embedded with magic. I was watching him carefully. Often the way his feathers reacted told me much— other denizens' reactions weren't as easy to pin down. That is what it is. Not much more was known about it. As far as I know, it was found in the ocean a century ago. But James said no one was sure what type of gem it is. When faceted about twenty years ago, the notes state each section removed crumbled into dust minutes later. James said without a sample, there wasn't a way to any sort of testing as to its age. Georgas watched the trillion cut gem in my hand, the pink seeming to turn redder to match his feathers. Do you know how James got it? Not really. I was his familiar, but not his equal. We were not as close as you and Carolyn, though I wished for that. I spent much of my time elsewhere. That comment made me smirk, though I felt a pang in my heart for what James had discarded. There were days I disliked that man— and days I felt sorry for him. You mean spreading gossip around the realms? I could barely hold back my laughter at this point. His feathers puffed up a bit. It is not gossip. It is information sharing. I only share facts. His indignant remark got a giggle out of me. <laughs> as long as you share nothing if I ask you to keep quiet, or it is a personal matter, I said, not all that worried about it. After all, most denizens regarded human issues as weird or slightly amusing. I would never, he protested. Why do you think so few knew what James was up to? I never spoke of it. I tilted my head. Jorgas, did James hurt or threaten you? All his feathers puffed up, and I felt carefully intense. Never, he turned his head, almost upside down. Corey. I liked James, but he was very private. He loved knowledge for the sake of it. Was he nice? Not by your standards, but neither was he cruel. He was much more like... Georges floundered for a moment, searching for something. He liked old books. If he was a character, I would say he was Ahab and Moby Dick. Obsessed, driven, impatient. But he asked questions about things and probed... I found that way of looking at life fascinating, so I chose him. He had a very strict code of conduct, which I found attractive. But he was not social, or given much to doing anything but research and talking to me about his research. He sighed, and it came out like a long trill. He was himself, flaws and all, but he shared anything that would help others. Mostly, he was happy living in his world of research, buying odd items and asking me to find information. That was primarily what I did for him, and it matched my passion to keep the beans up to date. But I also never told him about the council or the lords. 
It was information I did not choose to share, and it was never where his focus was. Does that help? It was the most direct I had ever heard Jorga speak regarding his life before his ashing. Carolian spoke, surprising me for some reason. Corey, you are different, and I received criticism in the beginning of how much I shared with you, and that I brought you freely into the realms. I never cared. You are my queen, and will do what I believe is the best for you, regardless of what others might think. Every time I thought I had my mind wrapped around what went on in their world, they revealed some other aspect I had not expected. I'm never going to understand all of this, will I? We are a different culture. Give yourself a few decades to be immersed in it, and maybe. For now, it doesn't matter. Carolian yawned, showing all his teeth. Get back to what we need to know now. I regretfully pushed aside the thoughts of how much I still underestimated and still didn't understand about the realms and focused on Georgas. The stone. He got it somehow. What made him think it was a focus and why was it called the Phoenix Heart? With a flutter of wings, he took a moment to settle down. It feels like magic. Can't you sense that? So it must be a focus. Many magic crystals are. What am I missing? The name. I pushed for the answer. Jorgas shrugged. An odd movement on a bird. He said it brightened when I got near it as it reacted to my flames. So phoenix heart. He ruffled a bit, looking at me. Then everyone else. Why? I watched him, surprised that he didn't know. Jorgas, I said, weighing each word as I spoke. Were you aware this is a memory stone? specifically the memory stone of Shira, Brix's mate. Jorgas went still, every feather and flick of flame freezing. It is a memory stone? Each word was said slowly, as if being pulled out one syllable at a time. Yes, but I can't access it awake. I fell asleep with it in my hand and it pulled me into it, and it was as if I was Shira not watching like the other stones I've experienced. A memory stone. He questioned again, as his feathers puffed up, blown by an unseen wind. Yes? I wasn't sure where this was going, but his response confused me. What is the issue? He pulled all his feathers toward him and ducked his head under a wing, creating a little phoenix ball. In any other situation, I might have teased him, but I could hear all of us holding our breaths, even the kids, as we watched. His bright feathers paled to a faded version of what they normally were. If he were a human, I might have said he was going into shock. Georgas? I started to worry, and even Carolian had sat up, staring at the ball of feathers. A ruffle of the feathers, and Georgas pulled his head out. I believe you. I just had not known... How many memories must have been lost? Stupid humans, so blind. Yet I didn't see either. The back of my skull throbbed with the beginnings of a headache. Jorgas, what are you talking about? He inhaled, and his feathers started to come back to life. There was a legend of a phoenix about to experience a final death. He gave a bitter snort. <laughs> Which, now that I think of it, Brash started that legend. I wonder if he knew. He shook himself. It doesn't matter. There is a legend that a phoenix which knows their final death is upon them can create a stone with their life in it, that the stone will be precious beyond measure, yet you will only know its worth in dreams. If I could get my hands on that phoenix. He trailed off. This must be what he meant. The original version would have just been a stone, nothing obviously fancy, but yet unusual. One of the reasons James bought it, and yes, I'm just now remembering, was because it was an unidentified gem. No one knew what type of mineral the stone was, and many suspected it to be a hoax created by a mage. Jorgas started to laugh. <laughs> he used it trying to figure out what it was, and it amplified everything. Of course it did. It was full of phoenix magic. It would have intensified everything to the same levels, the amount of energy that was put into creating that. 
If she died when the realms were sundering, then it was created with the energy that broke apart the worlds. The room fell silent as we all stared at him. Well, fuck. Joe's voice broke the tableau, and I turned to gaze at her. She shrugged. I guess we really need to know now, don't we? That we do, I said, looking at the gem with a greater respect mingled with overwhelming sadness. Chapter 37 the best-selling book series Adventures of Montana Smith, Rip Explorer, has just been optioned for a movie. The thriller series follows one Montana Smith as he dives into portals and rips to explore new places and find artifacts that were stolen by monsters. It is on book nine of the series and routinely lands on number one on the best-selling lists. We can't wait to see which adventure will hit the big screen. CNN Entertainment News. We let it be until Monday. We hadn't wanted to pursue it after that bombshell, and I'd asked Jorgas to see if he could find the child of Bricks and Shira. There was no reason that a phoenix couldn't still be alive. We would have done it that night, but another level five rip appeared, and I went with Carolyn to close it. Luckily, this one was a spirit rip, and Carolyn pulled me to the other side. Once I created a dam in the river, it closed without extreme effort. I let her say no, and she created a prettier reservoir than the dam I'd made. Sunday night, I was tired, even though my offerings had been much less than usual. I knew I could tell people the trick of getting to the other side to close rips, but Carolyn pointed out it would possibly result in a lot of dead mages, even those with familiars. The intelligence range for familiars, after I forced Carolyn to explain— seemed to go from him, higher than human intelligence, to Dolly, who struck me as about the average six-year-old, just more excitable. He'd admitted it was usually the more adventurous beings that became familiars, which didn't always mean the most intelligent, just more willing to take risks. I cuddled him close Sunday night and fell asleep to his purrs, my anchor to the world. You sure about this, Corey? Joe asked, sitting on the bed next to me the next night. I nodded, even as I snuggled down into my bed. Yep, I need to see the rest of the story and perhaps get some answers. I just don't know how many nights this is going to take, or worse, if the parts I need were in the parts removed. We both looked at the beautiful gem, but every cut meant knowledge lost. All I could do was hope it wasn't the parts I really needed. Hey, Maria. Joe said, looking back at the door. You sure you're okay to watch her? Joe and Sable both needed to work the next day. Marisol admitted she'd fall asleep, and the twins were kids with school in the morning. Yes, if she is distressed, I will get you, Hamadia reaffirmed. I have little need of sleep. She will be guarded. Joe sighed, then stared at me. <sighs> you better not get hurt and not get up fast in the morning until you're sure you don't have wings? Yes, ma'am, I said with a laugh. I'll be good. Now go. You have work tomorrow, and I have a mystery to dig into. Joe huffed at me, then kissed my forehead and left. I heard the door open and close. My eyes locked on Himadia. I'll be fine. Of course you will. She gazed at me with an inhuman blankness. You are the Herald. How could you not be okay? I choked, thinking about how awful I looked right now. I might not have been a particularly vain person, but I'd preferred having hair and some weight on my bones. How could I not? I responded, managing to keep the smile on my face. Okay, I'm headed to sleep, I said, holding up the stone clutched in my hand. Let's see what Shira has to show me. Hamadia bobbed, then faded away. Caroline humphed. <laughs> I would never allow anything to happen to my queen. I know. I rubbed his sides, amused that I was stuck reassuring everyone I'd be fine. The mix of humor, love, and wonder lashed at me as I curled around my living pillow and settled myself for sleep. Sleep came easily, and I slipped into the darkness.
my wings tucked tight into me as I streaked down from the skies to the white structure that opened to the sun, the building my nest was in. It stood tall into the sky, but possessed many openings for light and breezes to slip in. They used the open room of gray stone bricks for rituals and quiet communion with magic. There were circles laying out the places of magic, the different branches. Hot springs kept the entire area under this portion of the land warm, which was also why the crops were so rich and abundant. The bunch of dried seaweed in my beak would work well with our nest. I admired it as I flew toward where Bricks was working on creating a home for our chicks. Nest was a misnomer for the work of art that lay before me. We took the materials and used magic and fire and light to warp and change them, creating a structure that looked more like a multi-layer basket than a nest like a bird would make. The green of the seaweed would add splashes of color against the red and beige. It had three spaces, one that would be big enough for me to slip into and settle over eggs, pushing my magic into them, another that we stored food for the time when I couldn't go far from my eggs, and a third open area that we would rest in. My light, you've returned, Brooks's voice said in my mind as I landed on the open area. Always, though I feel the time is drawing near, not as soon as we had supposed, but still, the nest should be done in the next moon. The magical time when I would be fertile was approaching. Phoenixes took longer to hatch and mature than most, though not as long as dragons, but easily approaching a cycle of the sun before they could fly. We needed to surround the eggs in magic and let them develop in their own time. Yes, the shortest day is coming fast. That day and not the longest, Bricks asked as he plucked the seaweed from my beak and applied it to the walls as a design. Yes, the shortest. By the longest day, they should be ready to hatch and meet their parents. I felt magic hum in my mind and body. We had delayed building as I made sure this was as good of a place as Bricks implied, it had taken multiple cycles of the season before I agreed with him. The land was rich and fruitful, the people accepting and welcoming, and those that served magic were strong and true. They were even entertaining for limited beings. A shudder rushed through me as I imagined being unable to fly. Then I look forward to our family. Bricks preened my feathers, pulling me back to the work at hand. Blessings of the light on you. A rich voice called out from the open area below us. I pushed my silly maid away and looked down to see Zenobia moving into the area carrying offerings for magic. In the cycles we had been here, she had grown strong and true, her magic full and rich. On the shortest day, she would take over the mantle of guide from her mother. Magic favors you, I replied. It is fun. How goes the building of your house? She seemed interested, and I trilled in amusement. I jerked as my life skipped and jerked. With a shudder, I watched Zenobia in all white kneel before their altar to magic. The mantle of Harold cloaked her, and Brooks and I trilled in surprise and celebration. That had not been expected, and I watched the girl, child, woman now, flare with pride and arrogance as her magic swelled. Amusement filled me as I leaned into Brooks. She is a dragon with her power, hoarding and guarding. If she had wings, she'd make one to rival the others. Bricks nipped my neck feathers. Yes, but now I think the skies are calling us. Magic is swirling. Can you feel the call? I opened my wings, letting the magic from below swirl up and wash over me. I felt it kindling in my body. Instead of answering him, I launched into the sky letting Bricks chase me through the clouds, rolling with him as the light wrapped around us, and magic filtered through. My memory stuttered, and I sat in front of Zenobia, my eggs heavy in me. She was staring up at the sky, her magic buzzing like angry insects seeking to hurt and destroy. I do not understand your anger, I said, watching her. These last few months, her magic and rage keep rising. You are chosen by magic to be her witness. Your people love you. Why is there anger? In this place with abundant food, pleasant weather, 
I did not understand what drove her rage. You don't see? She waved her hands around. All they do is want, want, want. Zenny do this, Zenny do that. They expect me to be their servant because of magic's choice. What about what I want? Her anger at her role surprised me. Is that not the goal? To be a servant of the people? Like you are a servant of bricks? I notice you are the one staying here while he gallivants around. Does that not anger you? Her spite made me coo in sorrow for her own chains. No, this was planned and hoped for. I could be out flying, seeking food and other things, but staying here is safer for me, and it lets me give more magic and nutrients to the eggs I will lay, and soon enough, I will fly again. Her hand twitched, brushing away my words. You don't have age or pressure creeping up on you, or a mother that expects children, or men that expect you to be honored with their attention. I tilted in my head, having no basis for understanding. Bricks was my joy, and I still felt honored to have won such a creature. I do not understand. Do you not wish to have children? The snarl that rippled over her face changed it from what most of the humans called pretty to an expression worthy of a dragon's rage. And destroy my body? My eldest sister died giving birth, and her husband, the man that swore she was the love of his life, had another in her bed in three moons. I will not do that. I need more magic, more power, more something to let me know I am there better. I hope you find what you need, Zenobia. My words were sorrowful, but then I wasn't human. They had strange rules that made no sense. My opinion wasn't worth much. Oh, I think I found it, she said, her smile harder than made me comfortable. But like all things, it will take a bit of work. My trill filled the air. That was a truism, no matter what species you were. True, I wish you well in your endeavors. She smiled, and for a moment I wondered if she had dragon in her background. With a shiver, I pushed it off and launched into the air. Bricks and I made our home ready for the eggs. He roamed far, tasting the magic, while I stayed here, exchanging the occasional feather for a treat. Our eggs were laid, and I hovered over them most of the time, but Bricks gave me breaks, and I found myself following Zenobia. Not any reason, really, just she was one of the few on the island whose travels were not completely predictable. She wandered the hills and the trees, then went into the caverns. One day I followed her there, more out of my curiosity than anything. She wove under where the air all but rippled in the heat, and I thought how much Bricks would enjoy a bath down here in this hot air. I made a mental note to create a bath for him as a present once the chicks hatched. I hid in the shadows, muting my colors to let me blend with the walls. It was like playing find with others. It had been a while, but it seemed my skills had not faded. There, in the warmth of the caverns, she had created an altar, with each of the magics inscribed on it. The liquid rock down here all but bubbled with magic, and I could feel it as almost a living being, as Zenobia set offerings down in front of each of the symbols— channeling want and need into them. I watched for a moment as she pled for power and strength. I did not understand. She was the herald. What more could she want? After a bit, I left. But the strange altar with the sigils of magic burning with the light of magic disturbed me. Bricks was trilling when I landed at home. They are rocking, he said, and all thoughts of the caverns and Zenobia vanished as I focused on the new lives awaiting to meet their parents. It took many days, but finally the hatching of the eggs happened on the longest day of the summer. I found it only appropriate for that to match the long path from the shortest day of the year to now. I had been trailing to my chicks when I felt magic scream. My mind skittered, and Zenobia smiled at me. Shira, Bricks, may I have a feather from each of you? A tail? I have honeycomb to trade. Her smile was warm, beguiling, the eggs inside of me not heavy yet, 
Honeycomb sounded so good. Yes, honeycomb would be good. Bricks? He laughed at me, but we willingly parted with a tail feather. Time swerved on me again. The chicks hatched at the height of the sun. Three beautiful younglings. Only time would tell their abilities, but already one was of each of the magic streams. Spirit, order, and chaos. Bricks watched while I got some fresh air. Zenobia sat in the sun, a pile of fruit on her lap. The rich berries called to me, and I winged my way to her. Ah, Shira, are your chicks well? Yes, strong, one of each magic. They will be powerful. I can feel it. She smiled, her teeth too sharp, but I feared it not. I am working on a project for this evening, the shortest night. I will trade you berries for some of each shell. A bag full enough for all of you. I brightened at that. The idea of a long flight had not excited me, and a bag of berries was a good trade for something that I would have disposed of soon enough. I returned with shells and left with berries on that day of birth. The sun was high. My chicks fed. Bricks left, at my urging, to go stretch his wings and find some cactus fruit I craved. I crooned to the chicks, this their first day of life as the sun sank into the ocean, Magic changed. I shrieked as I burst out of our little home, trusting it to protect my chicks, and I looked around as the world rippled. I came from the caverns. I dove through the walls, wondering if the volcano had decided to rupture its container. Already I tried to figure out how to move my house. I could take things with me when I traveled to other places, but the magic lands were few and far away, and I never brought anything bigger than a melon with me before. My chicks were not even a day old yet. Could they survive? Did I have enough time for Bricks to get back to help me? He had jumped far away to get me a treat. I burst into the caverns where Zenobia stood, pulling in magic like I'd never seen, feeding into the volcano whose long, dormant arms the country nestled in. She had offerings for each of the magics, and she pulled feeding them into something that wasn't powerful enough to hold that amount of magic. The realm, this realm, started to fracture as she pulled in more magic. What are you doing? I cried. Fear for my chicks, this land, magic all warring with one another. I will ensure I am powerful enough that they can't trap me in their traditions and how women act. I will have enough power to make my own way. Magic will ensure it. She dumped power into a crystal the color of the fire below, and it glowed with pent-up energy. Magic won't work like that! I cried out, fear making my heart race. I'll make it. I'll make it give me the power, or I'll sunder it all together! Her voice rang with madness, and I spun, flying toward my chicks. But magic broke and bucked beneath me. It twisted into shapes that could not exist— and rather than wholeness, it shattered, driving pieces of reality away. I dove into my nest, my chicks alive and crying out in fear. Bricks! I screamed, but I knew he could never return that fast. There was nothing to do but protect my chicks. I pulled on my magic and wrapped it around us in a crystal shell, but it wasn't enough. Magic pushed against me and into everything I was, would be and had been. With a whoosh, it pulled into me, including my children, my love, everything that could have been crystallizing. The happy chirps of my children, becoming a part of eternity without pain or fear, were a balm to my soul as I quit existing, becoming of magic. Chapter 38 there are a few hereditary familiars, the two most famous being the Phoenix of Paris and the Dragon of China, but the dragon, whose name is Tiatang, is also where the choice of emperor lies. Earlier, when the dragon was injured, the question of who would choose the next ruler arose, creating disquiet in many quarters. While the creature might be immortal, it is obviously not invulnerable. Cory? Are you awake? Can you hear me? 
A woman's voice sounded far away and very near simultaneously. I blinked my eyes, or tried to. They seemed to be glued together. Wait a minute, she said. Something cool and damp scraped against my face and eyes multiple times. Try now. My eyes opened, and I stared at gray flatness. Where was the sky? Was that color from clouds? Corey, look at me. The voice was everywhere, but nowhere. I forced my head to move, though it was stiff and unwieldy. It flopped over to the other side where a huge cat lay staring at me. I squawked and tried to fly away, my limbs thrashing against fabric that entangled me. Peace, my queen. You are safe and human. Amused worry filled my mind, and I stilled, the sharp teeth taking up all my attention. But memory filtered in, and the life of a bird became more of a story, not reality. Carolian? My voice croaked as if I had been silent for eons. Excellent. Now turn the other way and tell me who that is. I obeyed, more because I had nothing better to do than fear. The lack of fear made me realize I didn't fear a cat with teeth big enough to make a snack out of me. A woman sat on the other side, looking worried and relieved. Familiar features and face. Marisol? A smile spread across her face and her body sagged as if the supports holding her upright were severed. You are starting to worry us. How are you doing? I wiggled my claws. No, that wasn't right. Toes. I had toes. I lived here. Hamadia. Wasn't Hamadia going to watch me? That was right, wasn't it? More stress faded at those words. She did, but after eight hours, and you were still asleep, I came over to watch you. She was well. Her focus was not stressed, Hamadia said, stepping into view with gray-green moss covering the bark of her arms and torso. Were you? Her head tilted the slightest bit toward Carolian. Not overly stressed, though my concern was rising. Twelve hours is a long time. Corey, can you stand? He stretched with a head-splitting yawn, and the avian part of me squawked and tried to fly again. This time, only my legs twitched. Yeah, pee sounds good. Then coffee? The fog that clouded my brain was thicker than normal, but I felt it would be easier to clear if I had some caffeine. After I get you downstairs... The last thing we need you to do is try to fly down the stairs and break your leg, or worse. Marisol replicated her actions from the other day and had me downstairs, eating and drinking before I had full command of my senses. She made me calorie-laden Mexican coffee that combined with a protein-filled omelet helped to push the confusion away. Cries of Mama Cory and pounding footsteps heralded the arrival of the twins, and soon enough, I had two limpets on my sides, each squeezing me like they hadn't seen me in months. Did you go see the story again? Jazz asked as she pulled back to look at me. I did, though I'm still thinking about what it meant. I leaned down to whisper to both of them. Flying is really neat. They giggled as their dragon zoomed through the house, flying above them with a freedom that I wanted to join. It was worth it? Joe asked, coming in, dropping a kiss on my head, then her mother's cheek. I think so, but I really need to let it settle in. The transition back to this world is the most disorienting aspect of it. I drank more coffee and thought I might remember how to walk without assistance at this point. Excellent. Well, we came by to check on you and waited until now, only because Amadia assured us that Marisol had come over. Sable squeezed me tight as the kids detached to race into the sunroom. We are headed out grocery shopping, and then if the kids behave, we'll take them out to pizza. Do you want to come with us? Hmm. A day out with them sounded good. Check with me after the shopping, and I'll see how steady I am at that point. But if I think I'm up to it, absolutely. Deal. Ten minutes later, they headed out in their SUV for groceries, 
while Marisol shivvied me into the sunroom. I sat, pulling the memories into my mind. There were parts that struck me looking at it now like a movie, though I did wish I could somehow rewind and zoom into the memories. The white-gray stones and circles that seemed to be a theme. The caverns, the volcano in the distance, even the trees that I'd never seen on Earth all resonated, but I couldn't place them. I shared images with Carolyn, asking for his opinion. Strange temple, but then humans always worshipped oddly. It does have the same feel as other places I've been in. The room in Japan and the palace in China. True. They had the same stark, smooth rooms with the symbols on the floors. Okay, I need to get back into my body. I stepped outside, and as it was almost 70 degrees, the temperature was comfortable. I went to the little lawn area near the fountain and moved through some yoga, needing to get my mind and body synced back up. Nothing fast or strenuous, but I was aching by the time I finished. Overall, I felt better and more human. Literally. The strident tone from the phone grabbed me, and I sighed. I pulled my cardigan back on and walked in as I answered the unwelcome call. Morning, Yolanda. Corey, I have a rip. We've not seen one in a week, but this one. Yolanda trailed off with a sigh. This one is just huge. Big enough that we can't close it. I'm hoping you'll be able to. I've had two groups try. They get a portion closed, then run out of offerings, and it slowly opens back up. I fought back a yawn. I wasn't tired, just exhausted. Nothing is keeping it open? Nothing obvious, she replied. Get me the info. I'll get there, but it doesn't sound like it's an absolute emergency. I was stretching as I spoke. I needed another hour to make sure I was really human and not a bird. And there are no sharp drops or anything near it, are there? I had the sudden vision of me jumping off, expecting to fly. The vision of me plummeting to my death made me swallow hard. Um, no sharp drops? Yeah, we've been trying for a few hours, but it is blocking a major highway. It's in Atlanta at the 75 and 285 merger. Oh, I said, perking up. It had been a while since I'd been back in Georgia. Top or bottom? Um, it says near Cumberland? Top. That makes it easier. Get me who I should contact and I'll head that way, but let them know it will still be about an hour. I walked toward the door, still swaying a bit. There wasn't a tail there to move to alter my direction. Humans were designed weird. Got it. Head it your way. I could hear her typing as she talked. I hung up and moved through the house. You hear that? I called out to Carolyn. I did. No, I'm not sure that I approve of you leaving now, but if you keep moving, you should be fine shortly. He had risen from the floor, stretching himself. Yeah, let me get my clothes changed, get you in your harness, and get my bag ready. Then we'll head that way. I spoke as I was walking toward the stairs. I heard the young lady. Where are you going? Marisol stuck her head out of the kitchen, looking at me. Atlanta, huge rip. Marisol blew air out lifting her bangs up a bit. And they need you? This one is just huge. I'll be careful, but let Joe and Sable know. I sighed. Getting pizza with the kids had sounded fun, if exhausting. And they'll make you some energy bumps. She turned her formidable attention on Carolyn. You ping me if anything goes wrong. She pushes herself too hard. Yes, she does. And I will. But this sounds safe, even to me. I feel motion and being Corey will help her more than sitting here. Carolyn rubbed by me as he headed to the stairs. I rolled my eyes in loving amusement. What would I do without these people in my life? Twenty minutes later, I was indeed moving slow, but at least I wasn't looking for my wings any longer. Carolyn was pulling me through to the crossroads with my backpack stuffed with emergency supplies. She said it was near Cumberland Mall. You remember that? Of course. The all-you-can-eat Mongolian grill was there. We should have lunch there before we return. He opened a portal, and I could see the lights flashing and the gash against the sky. That looks like the place. We stepped out, 
and I started walking over to the cops that had everything blocked. Sorry, this is a restricted area. Stay back. A young officer, his uniform almost squeaky new, said with authority. I smiled and tapped the side of my head, highlighting my tattoos. Merlin Corey Monroe, they sent me to try to close this portal. I'm looking for Captain Jennings. I learned to keep it simple. One minute, ma'am. He turned to speak into his handheld radio. I tuned it out as I looked at the rip. It was indeed huge. I was standing on the ramp from 285 to 75 North, and the gash blocked out all of 75 North and 285. The roads just disappeared into the open space. If there had been lava or water pouring out, the damage would have been extensive. Instead, it was just emptiness. Carolian, where is that pointing to? I couldn't look long as the seams of the portal pulled and taunted, but I knew he could withstand it better. I turned to look at him only to see his ears pulled back and a snarl on his face. What? I will get Esmir. She needs to see this. His tail lashed back and forth as he continued to emit a low growl. Let me get up close first, so hopefully the huge cath showing up won't spook anyone. He just nodded, and I turned to the young officer. Well? The captain is coming, he said, nodding behind him. A large woman with obvious Samoan heritage was stalking toward me. While not frowning, she had the don't-mess-with-me vibe clear in her every motion. You the help? She snapped out giving me and Caroline both once-overs. For some reason, her tone caught me wrong. Help? I'm here to assist you, but I'm a Merlin, not the help. She blinked at me and then sighed. <sighs> Agreed. My apologies. There's a bit of angst over this. She waved her hands, and I focused on the sea of cars around us. I glanced at my watch and saw it was 11 in the morning. Wait. This has been open for hours? Did this happen during rush hour? I had a lot more sympathy for her. Atlanta traffic was notorious in the first place, but if this had happened during rush hours, she was probably getting yelled at by everyone that knew her name. Yes, the only thing that saved this from being a bigger issue is it started small enough that cars stopped before they went into it. As it is, I have two cars that had damaged as they clipped the edges— one heart attack from having to slam on the brakes to avoid going into that. But otherwise, it is just there and cutting off everything. I let loose a long sigh. <sighs> I'm very glad no one went in. I may get closer and I'll see if I can shut it. She nodded and waved me under the police tape, and I followed her past where they had their cars acting as a barricade. On the other side, everything just ends into blue sky, and if you touch it... It zaps back like static electricity. Fried a few phones. Every one of these seemed to be different than the last. Okay, I'm looking. I felt around it, and it was just a rip, sitting there. It resisted me closing it, but not that hard. Carolian, where does this go to? He still stared at it, his fur standing on end and his ears laid back. His snarl had every cop in the area backing away with their hands on their weapons. It is to the realm created to contain the excess magic. It burst. The outpouring of magic is keeping it open. Esmir is coming now. His words matched the slice of pain as Esmir stepped out. Her reaction was exactly the same. This should not happen. She snarled, and I flinched a bit as the words sliced into me. Softer, please. I get that, but how do I close it? I looked around at all the people with magic spilling over them. The odds were everyone in the right age range would emerge. Probably a few outside of the normal range. There was that much magic spilling out, something I could sense after they pointed it out to me. I pulled out my phone, sending Stephen a message, and asking him to give the OMO a heads up. We wait. When the magic is completed flowing, then we can close it. It should end soon. She sat down, tail twitching. But this means our solution isn't one. This has to stop soon. I rubbed my eyes. 
the image of a temple with gray floors dedicated to magic floating in my mind. Much to everyone's annoyance, I couldn't close it until 3 p.m. By then, the governor had declared it a work-from-home day as the major arteries were impassable. Esmir went back to the realms to talk to Freya and Tursane. I expected a council summons in the near future. For my part, I headed home and caught up with Sable and Joe. Closing the rip hadn't been that expensive once the magic quit flowing. I'd only needed to use the two weeks' growth on my skull to close it, but the ramifications were exhausting. I pushed everything away and enjoyed pizza and games with the kids. We got a few stares, but for me being able to be out with them and enjoy living made it worth it. Chapter 39 our favorite Merlin, Cory Monroe, has now been spotted in China and France. Our girl sure gets around. If anyone has pictures, be sure to upload them for a chance to be our Cory Candid of the day. But this does raise other questions. With her jet setting around the globe, is she at risk of bringing infections home, or worse, bugs that shouldn't be here? We all love Carolyn, but he is an animal. What if a new type of tick or another parasite hitches a ride home on him? CNN, Mage Focus. The next day, I was having an early lunch, and I felt like myself, though there were still the occasional twitches. My phone rang, not the discordant noise that was Yolanda, so I answered it. Yolanda, I might have hung up on. I didn't feel like dealing with any more drama that morning. This is Corey, I said, not looking at the phone. My sandwich called my name, but I drank some iced tea, waiting. Good afternoon, Corey. Seat Lolly's voice came through, and I relaxed a bit, but still resisted the sandwich. Crunching in someone's ear wasn't good manners, and I liked Seat Lolly. Afternoon. Has the council meeting been called already? kind of thought I had received notice via Esmir or Freya, but what did I know? A council meeting? Not that I know of. Is there one? She sounded confused, which made me more confused. Probably soon. So if you aren't calling about that, what's up? I pulled out a pickle that was sticking out of the sandwich and nibbled on it. The elders wanted to know if you would come meet with them today. They would like some feedback. I stopped nibbling. Wait, the AIN members want to meet with me? Yes, then dinner with my family afterward. There was a hint of hope in her voice, along with an undercurrent of worry. Sure, give me an hour. I need to eat and change clothes. I'd slipped back into lounge clothes and wasn't going anywhere in those, and I'd eat my sandwich first. It was an excellent sandwich. Will do. I'll be there at 1.10 p.m., your time. I glanced at my watch. Yep, that sounds good. She hung up, and I focused on food. While the rift hadn't exhausted me, I was still trying to put on weight and build energy. Then I got ready to visit the AIN with excitement rippling through me. I hadn't heard of anyone who had been in the AIN ever. The AIN provided fodder for constant tabloid discussions, but I thought I'd heard news of some recent talks with various governments. I took a minute to call the news articles up on my phone. And sure enough, there had been three sets of delegates in the last six months talking to different governments about lowering the barrier. That barrier had been there for centuries already, but it was different from the ones James had discovered, the one Hisahito had desperately desired. Maybe I'd find out how they created the barrier. Anything for a bit more knowledge that might hold the key to everything. I dressed in my normal outfit, just in case I ended up running for my life. While I knew Carolyn wouldn't wear his harness there, it got shoved in my backpack, just in case we needed it, ready to go. I headed back downstairs just as Kessis pinged me. May we step in? Hamadia, incoming. She and Carolyn communicated, but I tried to let her know when others were coming, at least those not family. A moment later, Kessis and Sitlali stepped out into the little square in the corner. Afternoon, what's the occasion? Looking at Sitlali, I felt a bit underdressed, but I let it be. 
She was wearing a long broomstick skirt in shades of blue, with a tunic and cream with embroidery running along the bottom hem and the neckline. Her various types of long braids fell to her waist. She still had on her belt, holding knives and a pouch, and her ever-present moccasin boots. Changes are coming, and they would like a friend to talk to first. Her voice remained non-committal, and I rolled my eyes. Political ambush? Yep, she said with a shrug. I just shook my head. Oh well, I'm getting good at those. But are you sure you don't want Stephen? Regardless of what the Magic Council thinks, I really don't have any political power. I know. They know. But your name has come up multiple times, and they would like the input. She shrugged, and I looked at Kessis. Should I be worried? Caroline's ears flipped forward at that also, his focus sharpening. No, they only want to talk. I swear to that. Kessis took my question seriously, and I didn't know if that made me feel reassured or not. Let's go, I said, trying to pass by my own worries. A rip opened. By Kessis, I assumed, and I stepped into a courtyard that was open and airy. The sky above was the same as I'd seen at home, though at the moment it gleamed pale blue and had cotton ball clouds floating through it. At least there is sky here. I commented as she waved toward a door at the other end of the courtyard. The sun shone down, making the plants all but shimmer. I know, that weird diffused light in the realms is insane. I have zero idea if the creatures there even have circadian rhythms, or how they function without solar radiation. She commented, her voice sparking in interest. Oh, the realms have the radiation. I tested it once with solar panels. It's just very diffuse and low. So think constant cloudy day without rain levels. I looked around as I spoke. The courtyard possessed plants and raised garden beds, an apricot tree with a bench round it, and a small pond that had creatures in it based on the splashing and canted ears from both familiars. But why were the walls green? And were they fuzzy? Huh, that is interesting. The beast lands are much better, but the light is brighter and there seems to be seasons that mimic our own. She led me through the door and into an open area with a large table at one end and a woman working at the other end putting things in huge filing cabinets that took up most of the room. A door stood on the opposite side of us, leading outside. You don't have computers? I asked, looking at all the filing cabinets. We do, but so much of the records were on paper. We are still working on transcribing all of them into electronic media. That is what she is working on. As the team completes each cabinet, someone will go through and check the data. Then we will recycle the files. It is an ongoing project. Seatlolly waved me toward the table. They should be here shortly. I headed over to it, amused and somewhat appreciative that there were low ottoman-like seats for familiars as well. I settled myself in a chair that was against the wall so I could watch people come in. Carolyn stepped onto the low seat next to me on my right and curled up, his body fitting on the wide, upholstered ottoman. I approve of this much better than human chairs. I scratched his ears and watched. It took a minute, but the other set of doors opened, and people streamed in. The only things I could see they had in common were all of them, but one was at least one to two decades older than me, and most of their hair was in the wild mix of braids like Seat Lolly had. That, and none of them seemed happy to be here. Joy, I'm not that bad. Why can't someone besides my family ever seem happy to see me? There were seven individuals, and six of them settled on the side opposite me, while Seat Lolly finally settled down at the right end of the table, leaving the seventh person to sit at the left end of the table. Hi, I said, trying to project something other than exhausted victim. I'm Corey Monroe. Seat Lolly said you wanted to speak to me. We are the elders of Beastlands. 
or what we call the nation. We will introduce ourselves in the area we have responsibility for. The one who spoke was male, with all the various braids, but had a flat, grim look on his face, and his hair was white with no gray left in it. I am Elder Ria, and I am responsible for the smooth communication and governing within the nation. The next one spoke, a male in his seventies, with turquoise at his throat, wrists, and braided in his hair. I am Shaman Vakin, responsible for statues of Elthgar in the nation and Eldorgar. All of them spoke English, but with enough of an accent that I had to focus to pay attention to the words, not the sound. A woman spoke next. I am Chief Osis, responsible for the land and foods grown here. Mentally, I dubbed her Secretary of Agriculture. She had her braids twisted around her head like a crown, showing off feathers and ribbons that were twined within. The next person, a woman bigger than any I'd ever seen, not fat, but height and muscle, spoke with a voice that made me ache to hear her singing jazz. I am Elder Zitkala and my responsibility lay in technology research and implementation. I blinked at that and wanted to pepper her with questions, but I stayed silent to let them finish their introductions. Shaman Kinta, I am happy you are here. My responsibilities lie in education and family. He smiled, but as his head turned toward me, I saw sightless blue eyes. He was tiny my size now, with his white hair and a jumble of braids twisted in a bun on his head. A large hummingbird sat on his head, next to his bun, head cocked. Then his eyes turned, and his smile inched up a bit. Huh, seen eye bird. That's new. Chief Esports, military and diplomacy. You are welcomed. His voice sounded like gravel, and he gave me a sharp nod that exposed scars on his throat and chin. But he sounded more inviting than the rest of them. I turned to the last person, the one that didn't fit the general theme of everyone else. Round braids fastened with feathers and beads gleamed in the jet black hair, and the person was pretty. I couldn't say if they were male or female, just that they were healthy and oddly attractive, with white teeth and green eyes that sparkled. Cory Monroe, you are welcomed. I am Dakota Spirit Talker. I am the voice of the nation. The capitalizations were heard in the title. Hi, everyone. I tried to smile, but the formality caused a frisson of nerves to run down my spine. So, what is this about? Elder Wea spoke his flat voice neither welcoming nor aggressive, his dark eyes locked on me. Seed Lali has kept us informed of the council and the issues you are facing. We have been seeing rips in our lands as well, but we work together better as the beast realm, as the council calls it, works in harmony with us. We have been able to close these breaches without excessive damage, we wish to know what the ultimate goal is for you, regardless of the council. I slanted to look towards Seat Lolly. She lifted her shoulders in a tiny shrug. I just want to stop it and try to get things back to the way they were. But I don't know what I need to do. They nodded as if this didn't surprise them. Do you think if we dropped the borders around the nation it would help? the raspy voice of Chief Espoes said. I blinked in shock and Carolyn and stiffened next to me. Do you believe they are part of what is causing this? I don't understand how your borders work to even begin to answer that. There were quick glances between the members and Wea gave a sharp nod. That would be my cue, Dakota said with a smile. Short answer, I don't think so. Long answer, we need to take them down in the next few years, but the rips might force our hands sooner, and we'd rather do it at an auspicious time than have the choice taken from us.
Chapter 40 The Phoenix of Paris spotted at the scene of a rip. Reports say the Phoenix, which has always been attached to a family of bakers, was seen in full flame blocking creatures from coming out of the rip. It stayed there for an hour, protecting the city until mages could get the rip closed. Then it vanished. The family the Phoenix resides with has declined all requests for comments. CNN Mage Focus I don't understand, I admitted, wondering once again how I got into the middle of all of this. How is your wall created? Dakota smiled. You have created a bucket realm, correct? Yes, I said, shifting in my seat. I had no choice. A pocket realm seemed the only possibility to contain a nuclear device. That didn't seem to come as a surprise to them, as no one reacted. Dakota continued. The border, which blocks off ten sections of this planet, is essentially a series of thin pocket realms with pathways between them, and they all link to the beast realm. I blinked at that. It seemed so easy and hard simultaneously. What exactly is the beast realm? I fought with myself to not ask questions nonstop. Sticking to the things I needed to know and understand were the best options, if the least satisfying. When magic washed over us, it gave us an option. There were many creatures that time, and men were destroying, and there were many mystical creatures that felt trapped in the sunless lands. We agreed to share our lands with them, and they, the realms, with us. So we created the nations. They are all the creatures that wish to live as creatures, and those that magic grabbed to protect. Here, we have many of the animals extinct in the rest of the world, and those that are of magic, but not like your spirit animal, or Kinta's Mimi. I'll take your word for it, but aren't animals from magic all sentient? I would never understand how Esmir and Caroline could eat something that could talk to you. One more of the many agree-to-disagree topics. Yes, Dakota said with a smile, which is why they slay us. They have the right to dine on our bodies as much as we on theirs. If the next words out of your mouth are, hot sauce solves everything, I'm done. There was no way I could handle an entire culture with the same attitude toward food as Carolyn. They stared at me. Sitlali started snickering first, then Dakota. Zitkala and Wea fought smiles as the others sighed and just looked exasperated. That is a conversation many of us have had with our spirit animals. Your confusion is understood and shared. Dakota's lip twitched. It is still an ongoing and cherished argument. I snorted a bit at cherished, but let it go. So, what exactly do you want from me? Zitkala, in her rich, deep voice, responded. Do you think we should pull down our walls now, or wait until something forces them down? We need an outsider's perspective. My eyes widened as I stared at them. You understand I am not in the government, and I'm only aware of a small fraction of the world at large, right? Why me? Shaman Vatkin nodded. We know, but for all the people we have in the outside world, they are either tourists or they are limited to experiencing a tiny part of the world. You have seen multiple governments from the inside and have dealt with a council full of beings that have only a passing familiarity with humanity. And yet, you are respected by all. We understand your answer will only be your opinion, but what and how you say it will give us much to think about. His turquoise caught the light as he spoke, and even though this group of people didn't seem welcoming, I didn't get resentment from them. I leaned back in the chair and reached out to Bet Caroline as I pondered my response. They let me think not giving any signs of being impatient while I processed my answer. At that moment, I really wanted some ice cream-laden coffee so I could sip while I tried to think. This is just me, but I think you should wait. I could see the question in their eyes, 
so I tried to explain my thoughts. Right now, everyone is on edge with the rips. They would love to blame someone. And if you are right about all the areas you block off, when they fall, it might cause people to blame you or give them convenient scapegoats. Not to mention that your people, society, don't wear tattoos. It will cause a lot of strife and pressure from other governments and the OMO. I would wait until either the rips force down your walls, which makes you look like victims, or there is a resolution for the rips, one way or the other. But absolutely, start talking to the governments because... I trailed off, then shrugged. I might as well offer everything versus offering nothing. Governments are the worst of humanity. They want power and control, and they will want so badly to control you. If you aren't already viewed as equals by the time the walls come down, there will be a feeding frenzy to control you. A ripple of reactions went through the table, and some of them glanced at Dakota, who just kept a pleasant smile. Finally, Elder Waya spoke, his voice soft, though his face could have been carved in wood. That is in accordance with some of our thoughts. The tattoos were not something we had considered. The braids are not enough. Braids? I said dumbly. Then I actually looked at all of them and the fact that Dakota only had one braid. Wait, those say what type of maid you are? Seat Lolly looked at me this time, surprise on her face. You did not know this? I threw my hands up to shoulder height in exasperation. How would I know this? Mages braid their hair constantly. Why would I assign any value to braids? Shaman Quinta, his mouth and eyes smiling as he faced my direction with his blank eyes, said, I suppose that is unreasonable of us. The joy of inherent cultural understandings. Spirit is a round four-strand braid. Or order is the five-strand, and chaos is a fishtail breed. I turned and looked at them all with eyes that saw what I'd missed before. How do you tell strength? That confused me, as I still didn't see any indication implying levels of power. Quinta shrugged. We don't? It makes no difference what level you are capable of. All Merlins can access something in every branch, and their strengths are mostly immaterial. And you don't worry about people braiding their hair to appear to be other than what they are? I pressed, now just more curious about the cultural aspects. No. Quinta sounded confused. Why would you pretend to be a spirit mage if you were an order mage? I could only answer with a shrug. I mean, I guess that doesn't matter, but... What about those without magic pretending to have magic? Or people with magic pretending to not have it? That can get you in big trouble with the draft. Ah, Quinta said, and I saw Chief Espoes clench his hands, then relax them as if giving in to a situation he hadn't wanted but was letting it go. That would be the second aspect, then. What? I looked between all of them, but they had the best poker faces. Only Seat Lolly's face seemed to be reactive. The nation doesn't have any members that aren't mages. We are all part of magic and earth. Dakota dropped this bombshell on me, and I just stared at them, trying to process that. Huh. Okay. I mean, I don't suppose it changes anything. So what now? I refused to ask about those incapable of using magic and the tersane thing. I'd had enough bombshells for one day, and part of me still fretted over being imprisoned under a roof, unable to see the open sky. The last thing I needed was dropping anything new on them, though the odds were Seat Lolly had passed on that information as well. These bird reactions need to fade and fast. Elder Waya nodded, his eyes still hard, but the corners of his mouth softened as he watched me. That was the extent of our needs. We wanted to see if you were who both Amadahi and Sitlali were saying, and they were correct. Enjoy your visit to our lands. Though we request lines of communication stay open, we have others who live in the outside world, 
but we sometimes need a true outsider perspective. Sure, Seat Lolly's got my number. You can call. Just remember I'm not anyone with power in our governments. I might be able to talk to a few people. Most won't listen to me. Or if they do, their power is limited. I wanted to make sure they realized that. Even being friends with Shishi didn't actually let me do anything besides ask a favor. And those were prickly in politics. Besides, I hated the idea of using a friend. That is understood. We thank you for your time. Chief Espoes said in his gruff voice. With that, he rose, and a moment later, the rest of them did as well. The final person to leave was Dakota, who nodded at me with a smile, then headed out the door. Sitlali sat at the end of the table, watching me. So, what next? I asked as I noted the expressions ripple across her face. She shook her head in bemusement. If you had bent me... I would have said you'd tell them to tear them down now, before the ribs did it accidentally, because ripping off the bandage would be easier and would divert attention from you and the ribs. I huffed at a chortle. <laughs> Honestly, didn't even think about that. It would definitely get people off my back. Think we can call them back and change the answer? I was smiling as I said it. Until the various governments realized I'd been talking to the AIN, at that point, I might never get out of a locked cell. I paused, suddenly unsure. They do know not to bandy my name about, correct? I mean, I'm not even sure of the legality of this. I waved my hand to encompass everything as I searched through my memory, trying to find anything about talking to AIN members. Seat Lolly waved her hand dismissively. It won't go anywhere. Mostly you will be mentioned in our internal meetings. There are multiple city-state chiefs who will be interested in hearing about this. But these plans have been in motion for a few years. This is just more data for them. She pushed up from the table, and I followed her movements. Carolyn, who had been quiet the entire conversation, jumped off as she led us outside. Stress that had been lurking in my shoulders faded as I saw the open sky above us. I was thinking I could give you a tour of the city, then dinner, Sitlali said with a question in her voice. I checked my watch, almost three in the afternoon. She'd mentioned the dinner with family when she called. That sounds good. I left text messages telling everyone where I was. A smile softened her normally stern visage. Excellent. Let me show you, Basse. She led me out of the courtyard we stepped into and onto the street outside. In most cities I'd been in, you had sidewalks, roads, and tall buildings with lots of little alleyways. At best, in small-town America, you would have cute buildings, wider alleys, and usually a max of three-story tall for the buildings. If you went to New York City, you couldn't see the sky unless you looked straight up in many parts of the city. This was different. We walked down a sidewalk of green moss, while vehicles without tires used a road made of dark blue flowers. There were buildings with windows and doors, but the walls were green. The roofs glinted in the light. There were bikes everywhere, and they had their own path that was made of tiny stones and a clear substance. So why green walls? And you have hover cars? Shock rippled through me as I watched a car zoom by. The rest of the area reminded me of future concept sketches for cities of the future. The walls are moss, and they regulate the temperature, collect water, and filter it back into storage tanks. We have solar generators on the tops of most buildings. We don't run electricity anywhere. Everyone produces their own. Seat Lolly pointed around the paths. They are a type of hover carves. We have magnets buried under the streets and the vehicles run on them. It took us five years to create linking interchanges between the city-states. The bike paths are from plastic we collect from your world. We melt it, mix in debris from building, and pour it out. It makes a very strong, flexible, and resilient path. Everyone has been enjoying the low cost for that. She talked as she walked through, pointing at things. 
The AIN wasn't a mystical city full of tech so far advanced it seemed like magic, but they obviously prioritized nature much more than we did. Everywhere sprouted trees, little open spaces. I saw deer jumping through undergrowth in small, wild lots that had bike paths through them. No building was over three stories, and all of them crawled with life. As we walked, she talked about this city and why she lived here. Carolyn followed, not saying much, but his nose twitched constantly. I just didn't know if that was in a good or a bad way. I actually have an apartment in one of the bachelor apartment buildings. It is filled mostly with single adults who have jobs that keep them busy with little time for family or maintaining a residence. It would seem horribly small to you. My apartment has a bedroom, a small kitchen, and a living area, then a toilet, only restroom. Each floor has communal showers. It's more efficient and lets us have nice large tubs for soaking. She gave me a wicked grin at that, implying more than soaking went on. I'm not sure what I expected, but this is fascinating. My head was swiveling constantly, trying to take everything in. It felt like a radically different culture, and one that I rather enjoyed. The moss. Do you think that is something Hamadia could do? The summers can get a bit much. Lolly shrugged. I'm not sure, but I could get the information on them and give it to you. Then she can decide. She walked ahead, aiming toward a neighborhood set off to the side. I ducked my head to keep my grin unseen. The amount of delight that filled me when others treated the sentience in my life as people never got old. Chapter 41 This Day in Magical History Today, in 1956, Air Hedge Mage Dolores McGuffin attempted a DIY air balloon ride for her daughter's birthday party. During her test run, something reportedly went awry, and the party-goers lost sight of her above the clouds. The whereabouts and or remains of the locally known as Balloon Girl have never been discovered. American cities tended toward grid layouts. Instead, the nation, or at least this city, created theirs in spirals and circles. The businesses were all in the center of a circle, with everything easily accessible. Then you went out to more of the manufacturing, though I didn't see any big shops, but lots of little ones. I saw at least five different cloth manufacturers, two clothiers, then a custom makeup shop, and a store with a name I couldn't pronounce that had an English below it. Graphs. What is graphs? I asked as we walked. Seat Lolly glanced over to see the store I pointed at. Ah, that is for plants, so you can graft different types onto your orchard. Personal orchard? That idea made me think back over what I'd been seeing. I started looking at the houses more carefully. Most of them blended into the land, with parts of it under the ground, and all of them had neat garden areas staked out full of plants in a tumultuous burst of vines, leaves, and fruit. Most people have a tree or two that is theirs, but we also have neighborhood orchards that everyone shares. Most families have gardens, and we raise a significant portion of our own food, though a few things have changed over the years. Hothouses, freeze-drying, canning, processing of animals— all things that people want and complain about at the same time. She flashed me a grin as she turned down a street where if I hadn't seen a house being built, I would have just assumed this entire area was gardens. And the bachelor apartments? I asked, looking around. It was too quiet, especially compared to my area. There was no sounds of cars or heavy equipment, and no kids running around. And where are the kids? The temperature hovered around 80 degrees, so no reason not to have kids around. Bachelors don't have individual ones, though there is a hydroponic for vegetables so you can grab fresh food, usually carrots, squash, tomatoes, peppers, those sorts of vegetables. That is part of your rent. Someone else maintaining the building garden. As for the kids, school or jobs right now, she said. But they should get out soon. Get ready to be swarmed if they see you. 
you'll be fascinating to them. Carolee and Mike get mauled to death. They know any creature they see here is a familiar, and the majority of ours love attention. Yes, Kessis chimed in. They do scritches and pets. You will enjoy. Carolee tilted his ears forward as we moved past the school, but no swarms of children came out to assault us. We kept walking, with me looking at everything, and Carolee and Kessis apparently in a conversation from the low mental hum that was just out of my hearing. Sitlali angled toward a large plot with trees laid out in front, with rows of corn and beans in between. This is my family's. They have a large area because they've been here a while and provide a lot of extra food to the store. They will like both of you. Kessis seemed relaxed, as did Carolean, so I pushed down any worry I might have had. There were so many implications with that statement that I wanted to follow up to. Instead, I followed her as we walked down a path, made up of the same materials the bike path had been, to a wall that was about seven feet high. Sitlali pulled the wooden gate open and waved me in. We walked into another courtyard, though this pond was more of a water feature with the stream running over a large area with several deep pools and trees and seats in the area. This is gorgeous. Do all the houses have this? Sitlali shrugged. Many. It's easier to keep a healthy fish garden in an enclosed area. Makes maintaining and verifying the fish are okay easier. I think my mother said we were having mammoth for dinner. A hunter found a wounded one, and most of the town got a share. A mammoth? I said slowly, unsure I'd heard correctly. Aren't they extinct? On Earth, not in the realms. It's where a lot of your mythical creatures exist. She walked up to the wall that held a large wooden door and pulled it open. Come on in. She glanced back at Carolyn, who was peering over the pond with ears pricked forward and a tail that had gone still. Carolyn, you even so much as wound one of my mother's fish and she'll have your hide on the wall. I followed, wondering how cave-like the house would feel. Instead, a bright airy space with diffused light coming down from skylights greeted me. The area we walked into was a large open area with a fireplace in the middle of a circle of chairs. Right now, it had obviously been closed down for the summer, and instead, a wooden platform set on it with a cherry tomato plant on it. To the right was the kitchen area, or at least I assumed that. A large round table with what reminded me of a Korean barbecue grill in the middle sat in one area. Behind that, I saw a wall of cupboards, with a sink and a metal contraption that I assumed was a refrigerator. To the left was a hallway with a woven stretch of fabric, blocking any further view. Tusa, we're here, she called out. Sitlali turned her attention to me. Do you need anything? Bathroom? It had been a while, and I drink a lot of water and protein drinks lately. She nodded to the wall directly in front of us with three doors. Use the one with the moon on it she said as she moved over to the kitchen. You need something to drink? Water, please? I headed to the bathroom. This, at least, was normal. A toilet and a sink. I used the small facilities and came back out to see Sitlali talking to another woman. This woman was rounder than Sitlali with only fishtail braids and her dark hair that was just showing hints of silver. Caroline was sprawled out in a patch of sunlight. Sitlali looked up and saw me coming out. Tusa, meet Corey Monroe. Corey, this is my sister Tusa. She's already met Carolyn. Tusa smiled at me, her eyes the same brown as Seat Lolly. Welcome to my home, Corey Monroe. I nodded, unsure of the social niceties. Thank you for having me. She gave me a long look, then nodded. You indeed have been using too much magic for too long. Dinner will be good for you. And you? She turned her attention to Seat Lolly. You have forgotten so much about having guests. Seat Lolly sighed. No, I was going to get her some water, but you shut up first. It had the sound of a long-standing tease between the two of them, so I didn't worry about it. I see, Tusa said, arching a brow as Seat Lolly laughed and headed over to the kitchen. 
Come, said Cory. Tell me about your world. I have so many questions. I'm waiting for the others to get here so we have time. She pulled me over to the low chair circling the quiescent fire pit and peppered me with questions about the rest of the world. Tusa was funny, smart, and eager to hear about my world. We talked as the familiars either slept or entertained themselves. Sometimes the difference was hard to know. Tusa knew some aspects about the outside world already, and about others had no clue. The inconsistent knowledge struck me as odd. A small bell rang, and she looked up. Ah, oh, the others are here. See, Lolly, will you go harvest three beefsteak tomatoes for zucchini and some spinach? She stood as she talked and headed into the kitchen. The mammoth has been marinating so a quick salad and zucchini to roast, and that should be a satisfying dinner. I had managed to stand before the door opened, and in walked John Talliance in his sheriff uniform and Sergeant Amy Johnson, also in uniform. His eyes caught me, and a slow smile creased his face. Merlin Monroe, nice to see you again. I inclined my head to him. Thank you for your help in getting the AIN to talk to me. I'd known Seat Lolly was his aunt, but this put all the pieces in place more firmly. Meh, it wasn't that hard since they decided to listen. The group is a bit hard-headed at times. He said dismissively, heading into the kitchen. He wrapped his arms around Tusa and dropped a kiss on the top of her head. She laughed and hugged him back as Seat Lale slipped out the door with a pair of shears and a basket in her hand. Everyone made Caroline and me just rest. The organized chaos was entertaining as the four of them worked together to make food. Amy was obviously a longtime friend, though I still wasn't sure if she and John were in a relationship outside of friends. It didn't matter. I was just curious. Fifteen minutes later, they pulled me over to the round table and set me down and pulled up two ottomans for Carolian and Kessis. The grill was going and circled by a wide section that then turned around it. It made it easier to share and get the various items to grill without having to ask anyone to pass whatever caught your eye. By this time, I was starving, so we spent the first fifteen minutes putting strips of marinated mammoth on the grill— along with strips of seasoned zucchini. The fresh salad had a green herbal dressing to go with that just made me want to coat everything with it. I take it that you aren't estranged from the AIN, I said when the first rush of eating was done, watching John closely. Nah, my superiors think they kicked me out because I have no magic and it never occurred to them to ask questions. It's a risk, as if I ever get tested it could cause issues. He shrugged. But since I don't use magic the way most Domo mages do, it is unlikely. And Amy? I turned my gaze to her. For her part, she just grinned at me. I'm Cover, a friend, and who am I to turn down Mammoth for dinner? That part I had to agree with. The Mammoth was rich, flavorful, and Carolyn had eaten so much his stomach distended as he laid on the floor with Kessis in much the same condition. So, if the council has you, why are they asking my opinion? Wouldn't yours be more nuanced? This was what was bugging me. Why ask me when they had no idea who I really was as a person? Oh, it is, but I'm a low person on the totem pole in a very rural area. I'm male, I'm not a mage, and I'm not dealing with the rips. I told them to get more info. We all know the walls need to come down in the next few years, but the opportunities to leverage what is going on now can't be overstated. Besides, all of our spirit animals like you, even the ones that firmly believe Gerlian could eat them given half a chance. Would not. have decided I am on a fish and mammoth only diet. Never again shall I mess with fur or small bones. Gerlian's murmured words made me laugh and glance over at him. You mean until tomorrow when you're hungry and there is a rustle in the leaves? I said. Or until then. His agreement made us laugh. I still just find it disconcerting. Why not someone in the government? Or, heck, run an online poll? I shrugged, both amused and fretful. My answers could be incorrect. And if you make a mistake because I thought something was the right thing to do? I trailed off on a question. Tusa snorted. <laughs> if we do something because of your advice, that is on us. We have information, 
the odds are yours is one of the least biased we have available. Like I said, we are working on how to integrate and retain sovereignty, but that is a problem for the elders, not us. Very crumble. I spent the rest of the evening talking to Seat Lolly's family. Tusa was John's mother. Seat Lolly had an interesting family. Tusa and Seat Lolly's parents lived in the Australia pocket, working on creating sustainable gardens and water sources with a vastly different climate, soil, and wildlife. All of them were extremely against anything besides native plants, so it was taking a bit of work to get a sustainable solution in a limited area, and worse, make sure it could survive the walls falling. They had secondary learning, but in a completely different structure than our schools, and everyone, as in all of them, had magic at magician-level minimum, which is why they all wore braids, except someone like John, who purposefully cut them off to infiltrate American society. I felt like I had dinner with spies or adventurers, though they seemed to react the same way to my stories. By the time we left, it felt like I had another family. Caroline brought me home, and I crashed after letting everyone know I was home safe. We'd left my cell phone at the house just in case I was being tracked, but it added one more group depending on me. And I fell asleep thinking of magic compacting everything I had ever been, could be, to a stone the size of my palm. Chapter 42 More and more cases of dementia are arising among the elderly mage population. This is requiring drastic measures for those with mild dementia— Oddly, the same effect that pulls the magic for those who are damaged or mentally disabled will pull it from these mages, but only when they are beyond any further aid. Those are rendered normal. But those with mild dementia are kept constantly drugged and most offerings are removed, no matter how dehumanizing it might be. We know this isn't the correct option for our elderly, but without research and funding, any other options remain undiscovered. CNN, Mage Focus. The next few weeks were quiet. The sort of quiet that convinced you maybe the monster under the bed had gone to sleep. I knew better. Possibilities loomed over me like a thundercloud created from fear and worry. I checked and Tursain wasn't overloaded with magic yet, and the Lord said they'd had fixed why the realm ruptured. Their random, non-committal comments about discussing it at the next council meeting told me something had gone wrong, and they'd fixed it. Esmir hadn't given Carolian any other information, which either meant she didn't know or had decided the information had zero imperative value to me. With her, you never knew. The kids were in their last few weeks of school. Next year, they would be in first grade. Time seemed to fly by, and they were growing just as fast— Part of me missed the simplicity of them as babies. My breasts and body did not. It had taken a full six months after breastfeeding to get my breasts back to normal size. I was more than happy to be done with aching breasts and waking up in the middle of the night for feedings. Yet my mood was melancholy as I thought about how fast everything was changing. I pushed off the mood with a shake of my head and picked up the next set of notes from the scholars in the library. They had had almost five full months, and while it would take years to read everything in there, the volunteers had skimmed through an astounding amount. But while the kernels of information they had pried out contained fascinating stories, tidbits, and hints, none of it shed any more light on the problem. My stress only continued to rise as nothing came forth. Even asking about the phoenix heart gained only vague rumors of a life not lived and transformative possibilities. Georgaz let me know that if Brash was still alive, no one knew where. I thanked him for his time, gave him a few tidbits to share with others, and tried to make myself believe all the silence meant good things. It didn't work. In an effort to distract myself, I called Indira. Big sister, mentor, friend. I hadn't talked to her in over a month. Hello, she answered in a distracted tone. Morning, Indira. I said, my smile clear in my voice. Corey, how are you doing? It seems ages since I last saw you. Indira's voice wrapped around me like a hug, and I settled down in the club chair, 
staring out the windows, but not really seeing the outside. Eh, I've put on a few pounds, so that helps. Though I miss having hair. I never realized how much hair kept your head warm. I rubbed my bare head as I said that, the stubble velvet soft. Her laughter bubbled through the phone, and I realized I needed to find time to hang with her. <laughs> I can see that. Hopefully that issue will be gone soon. Any word on an ultimate solution? Not yet. There are a few things that are falling into place, though that doesn't mean solutions. An instruction guide to this whole Herald thing would have been nice, I said with a wry tone. Trying to figure this out is worse than putting a puzzle together with the back side up. Have you done that before? Her voice laughed. No, but it feels like that. What have you been up to? I wanted to get the conversation off of me. I was tired of being the one everyone worried about. Are you still doing custom chip designs? Not right now. I'm assigned to one of the emergency response teams. I'm getting better at closing rips, even if spirit mages still tend to be better at it. My team responded to most of them in the D.C. area. If nothing else, I've been stretching myself in ways I haven't for years. But I'll admit, I keep hoping this will all go away soon. I'm getting too old for this sort of adventure. Indira was in her 50s, I knew, but she could easily pass as being in her late 30s. Her skin had no wrinkles, and her style seemed ageless. Tell me about it. I'm years younger than you, and I'm exhausted. You are burning yourself out. I am trying not to do that. Mostly, I just would like Stephen to retire. She paused for a second, then said in a hushed tone, Can I tell you a secret? You can't tell anyone. Sure. One minute, though. I set the phone down and called out. Amadia, please don't listen to this conversation for the next 15 minutes. Her disembodied voice drifted down. Very well. I shall go and tend to Zelenka. I waited a minute and picked up the phone again. Go for it. She cleared her throat, then said quietly, <clears throat> As soon as this is done and Stephen retires, I'm going to ask him to marry me. The squeeze sat in the back of my mind and I had to struggle not to let it out. Really? That's great! And totally leads to the next thing. Want to go shopping when this is over? I need some new clothes, and I want something that isn't so oriented to dealing with drama. Something that will help me feel better as I gain some weight. Yes, I need a dress to propose in. I want him so stunned when he looks at me, he's going to be thanking his magic for delivering me into his life. I giggled at the imagery, and we kept talking for a few minutes until she got called to respond to a small rip in the area. We said our goodbyes, and I took a minute to close my eyes and think how lucky I was to have her in my life. We need to have our friends over more, I said, mostly to Carolyn. Oh, and you can't mention anything either. Marriage is a weird human formality. Mate, enjoy mating, then when you no longer enjoy it, move on. He lay on the window seat, the sun heating his body. Easy for you to say. Do you even know your father? He flicked an ear at me. I am aware of his existence and who he is. He and Malkin agreed only for the duration of her pregnancy, and once we could walk, he left. He is a traveler of the realms and did not wish to stay as a father, but Malkin admired his skill with spirit. That was the first I'd heard of a calf not being of chaos. He was spirit, then? Yes. He was born there as an experiment, and it seemed to influence his magic, but he felt it set him too far apart from the other cath, hence his desire to travel. Do you hate him for leaving your mom? Carolyn chuffed out a laugh in my mind at that. <laughs> Esmir chose him because he would not interfere in her life. We are not human. Do not expect human emotions. He was an excellent specimen and provided strong magic and genes for us. What more do you expect? I opened my mouth to argue about providing and caring for your children when a voice rang in my mind. Arthur Lord Munro, your debt is being called in by the family of Graffine. Your attention is required. The voice was unfamiliar, and the name Graffine meant nothing to me. Who is this, and what debt? 
I double-checked my arm, but the three sections of the horn were still empty, the base one filled. The snake and cat whiskers lay unmoving on my arm, though that passiveness didn't make me feel secure. I apologize, Earth Lord. I am Order Lord Ilian. Per instructions from Salastra, the villagers that were traumatized, due to your actions, have called in the debt you owe them. The cool, precise voice awoke images that I'd avoided over the years. Parents of children terrified because I had attacked, thinking I was saving them. Even now, I winced at the thought of what I had done. Stupidity didn't begin to cover it. Ah, uh, yes. What is the need? I answered as soon as the memories hit. A rip appeared in their village and several children tumbled into your world. They are requesting you retrieve their offspring and close the rip. The second the word rip echoed through my mind, I was up out of my office and headed into my room to change clothes. The last month had helped, and I felt like I could handle most things. Can you give Caroline your location so he can get us there? I pulled up my pants and buttoned them while I waited. Of course, they do need assistance. Her quiet voice didn't make me feel any better. I'll be there in ten minutes, or less. I mixed my assurance with a dash of hope that I could get out the door and there in less. I shall let them know. She disappeared from my mind, and I finished with my shoes. Harness, I may need it for multiple reasons, Carolyn said from my side. Without responding, I had him in it with all the various pouches secured. I grabbed my bag and headed to the kitchen, calling Marisol as I went. In a minute, I'd given her the rundown of what was happening and where I was going. I grabbed water and food and looked at Carolyn. You know where we're going? Yes. You ready? I did a quick double check of everything and nodded. A moment later, we stepped into a small village. Thatched roofs, a central well, and low fields greeted us as we walked into the middle of it. Quaint described it, as well as low tech. But looking at the denizens that were headed our way, it didn't need to be more. I saw gorgons, griffins, a few cath, and some chitarians. I tried to figure out how this disparate group all worked together but the rip gaping across the middle of the area grabbed the majority of my attention. It wasn't as big as some, but it distorted the ground and the area below it. Two gorgons slithered straight to me, followed by a large chitarian. You are the Earth Lord, the one that owes my family, one of the gorgons demanded. She was about my height, darker skin than Tersane, and had five thick snakes on her head. Yes, can you tell me what happened? I didn't waste time with anything else, as I could see glimpses of road and grass through the moving rip. The children were playing in the square while we were working, she said, waving at the rip. Before we could pull them away, a few tumbled in. Watchers went after too many breaths, the Chitarian said. No returned with hushlings, no safe. It took me a few seconds to parse out the Chitarian meeting, but then I followed up. How many of what species? I knew I needed to go get them ASAP, but I couldn't take the risk of missing any. Maybe luck would be on my side and the place on Earth was in a peaceful pastoral area. Even as the hope ran through me, I knew it was a false one. If it was rural or quiet, they would have pulled the children back already. Three gorgons, a griffin, and two older chitarians. One of the gorgons responded promptly. The gorgons are mine and my sisters. The griffin parents are not back yet from hunting. Watchers, younglings, not hatchlings. They jump, not wait. No word, worry. The chitarian was about three feet tall and a dark green with brown strips and ten legs. The legs in question were tapping restlessly, expressing the worry involved with the words. You can't talk to them? My voice was sharp as I didn't know if that had other ramifications. Rams apart, too young, too unfocused. I nodded, figuring teenagers, scattered attention, and they should have called for backup. That much I could handle. The big question would be, what were the humans doing? Thank you. I'm headed to see if I can get them back here. As soon as that is done, I'll close the rip. 
Multiple heads or tails or legs bounced up and down in agreement. I turned my attention to Carolyn. Do I step through or hold on to you to go through? He stared for a minute, his fur a bit more puffed up than usual, tail lashing. Hold on to me and close your eyes. We moved over the rip. I wrapped my fingers around the loop in his harness, and we stepped through from the realm to Paris. Chapter 43 Emergency alert. This is not a test. We have spotted a rip with creatures emerging in the immediate vicinity. All residents should return to their homes and lock their doors. Do not attempt to interact with these creatures. They are considered extremely dangerous. Do not call 911 to report sightings. The correct authority is being contacted. Repeat, this is an emergency alert. Emergency broadcast system. Noise, a chilly wind, and the smell of something burning assaulted me as I opened my eyes. My first breath turned into a cough as I inhaled smoke. I coughed as I looked around and tried to get a handle on what was going on. Down! Carolee embarked, and the next thing I knew, I was on the ground with something flying over us, spewing smoke. I thought to breathe between the calf on my chest and how hard I'd hit the ground. I lay there breathing and listening. The chaotic mass created enough confusion that I couldn't make out anything, but knowing someone was throwing smoke grenades was not a positive sign. Let up, need see, I wheezed out, pushing at his body. He snarled, but slowly moved off me, and I clambered back up to my feet. The Eiffel Tower was behind me. The admissions building for the tour should have been right behind me, but the rip wavered instead, creating a gaping ripple of magical danger. Around me were various police cars, their lights spinning and sirens screaming. More and more police were lining up in riot gear, and I could hear and see more vehicles coming. The tower straddled a paved area with green space on either side. I had stepped out right underneath the tower facing a long green field, kind of like the water feature at the Washington Monument, but with grass. Cops were converging from everywhere, people running and screaming behind them, and a thousand people with phones out filming it all. Where are they, Carolyn? We need to find three Gorgons and a Griffin, plus two teenage Chitarians. I scanned the area, wishing the families had provided me pictures, so I had some idea how large the Gorgons were, or what colors the Griffins sported. Screams came from my right that had a certain high pitch to them I recognized. The pitch of a scream when you saw monsters, versus random danger, excitement, or anger, contained a sharper, more panic-stricken note. Less horror, more denial. It said way too much about my life that I could tell the difference in screams. I spun to my right, searching for the source of the sound. There, near the support, Carolyn said, even as he bounded away from me. I locked onto the area he was talking about, and I saw it. A head of snakes, a pretty face, and people cowering while others were oddly stiff. A police officer was lifting a gun, pointing it at her. No! The snarl came out without conscious thought. I grabbed earth and yanked it up, creating a wall between the cop and the gorgon. Caroline was already there, weaving around her as she looked around wildly at the humans freaking out. Get her out of here! I shouted as I looked for the other one and wings. A griffin shouldn't be that hard to find. They were a winged creature and the panic surrounding them would be noticeable, right? A slash of pain along with hissing told me Carolyn had opened a rip, but I didn't have time to look, still straining to see the missing others. Movement ahead in the green space, a flash of white caught my attention. A swarm of police, all in riot gear, were circling something. Shields up, batons out, but above their heads I caught another glimpse of white feathers. Wings. Carolyn, headed to grab the griffin, I yelled figuring he would hear me or find me. His response consisted of a snarl of annoyance. I ignored it, trying to shove through the crowd. There were too many people. 
I need you. In a flash, the huge red cat was beside me, his hackles raised and tail lashing. When all fluffed up, he appeared to be larger than a tiger, and a snarl cut through the noise around us. Until more people started screaming and trying to run away, while others were trying to get away from something else. He pushed ahead of me, snarling the entire time, creating a path as people fell over themselves trying to get out of his way. Light flashed and I could hear the fake shutter sound from cameras. The newspapers were going to have a field day. I kept trying to get to the griffin before the police did, something irreversible, but too many people were between me and the circle around what I assumed was the griffin was getting smaller. I don't have time for this. A quick check verified there were no cars coming down the road. The press of people ensured even if a car had wanted to get through, they couldn't have managed. I pulled on magic and sent a KO spell and an arc in front of me, and people collapsed as they short-circuited their bioelectric systems. It created a fan of people collapsed on the ground in front of me, which meant I couldn't get through without risking grievous injuries or others. Ugh! Another pull of earth, and I lifted a path for me, causing bodies to tumble to the side. A quick check verified no one looked hurt. Then Carolyn and I jumped up on the path I created, racing toward the circle of police. A hawkish scream ripped through the air, making people cover their ears. A voice boomed. Corey, they are saying they will shoot anyone that moves. Carolyn's voice was tight and harsh in my mind. That isn't happening, I said, mostly to myself as I ran to the group, already exhausted. I was too worn down to do this, and I could feel my legs trembling as we raced toward the circle of cops. I started shouting when I was ten feet away. Stop this! I'll send him home! Two of the men turned their weapons up, pointing at me. I only had a few seconds to decide. In the U.S., attacking a cop was almost an automatic death sentence, but I wasn't in the U.S. With a heave of magic that physically hurt, I hurled out another KO at everyone in the vicinity, pushing it hard and using up the majority of my new grown hair. They collapsed like broken dolls, including the griffin. It was a male, about the size of Carolyn, but that meant too big for me to push. I'd have to be creative. Get an opening as close to the ground as possible. I'm going to flip him in. I looked around and then pulled two belts off of cops and linked them together. Then I folded the griffin's wings down and belted them. The last thing I needed in all of this was to hurt a kid and have the denizens pissed at me. A vague, harsh spread behind me, but I ignored it. Ready? Carolyn stood next to me, still puffed up. Yes, I said as I stood and used Move Earth to pull up the griffin. Carolyn opened a long, low rip, and I used the mound to tilt him into the hole. He rolled in ungracefully, but his wings were secured against damage. You did warn them he was coming, right? No, they can figure it out. He spat back as the rip sealed. It is my queen they are putting in danger, since they can't teach their kids how to avoid rips. He sounded pissed and scared, and I turned to see what he was looking at as the spreading quiet grew. The hush was explained as hundreds of people were staring at me, and then at the two huge spiders on the side of the Eiffel Tower. Oh, huh, I said as hundreds of phones were being held up and pointed in my direction. We really need to take care of that and get out of here. That might be a wise choice. His words were polite, barely, and I flinched at his stress. But right then, soothing him was stupid because this wasn't good. We took off toward the tower, this time the conscious people getting out of the way and the phones going the entire way. As we raced back the way we'd come, I heard the roar of vehicles approaching at great speed. I glanced down the road in front of the tower and flinched, a mix of army and police vehicles raced toward the tower, and I already had cops drawing their guns at me as I ran from the pile of fallen officers. Marlon's balls. This is going to suck. I readied my responses. I knew I could stop bullets, but I only had so much energy. 
We had almost made it to the towers when one of the Chitarians moved and people began to scream. Before I could react, the police had pivoted and bullets ricocheted off the metal as they scurried higher. No! I screamed the words as I dug a scalpel out of my pocket. With the ease of long practice, I had the protective lid off and the blade sliding through my skin, blood gushing out. I created a shield of dust, hair, anything that floated around. Then I heard the screams as a bullet bounced off and hit someone. I kept running. Another scream, this one sibilant, and I spun looking for it. There to my left stood a small gorgon, her tan skin blending into the brown of the metal. People had pieces of signs, their purses, and I saw a few mages getting ready to attack her. At this point, if screaming would have helped, I would have been screaming myself hoarse. As it was, I struggled to keep the shield up as I yelled to Carlian, Grab the Gorgon! I'll hold them off for another minute! He snarled but pivoted and raced to the child, bowling over people without caring about them, and I heard more than one person scream as he shouldered them out of the way. The girl was trying to stone people and kept focusing on the mages, her beauty flared into something almost sublime. Then it would fade. The people would freeze for a moment, then shake their heads. Their fear ratcheted so high they had formed a mob. I felt the portal open behind her, seeing the dark slash as Carolyn leaped and both of them disappeared into another realm. It sealed and I sagged. All I had were two Chitarians to worry about. More and more people were yelling and pointing at me, though that had been present since the second I stepped out of the tear. But now, they had me and the creatures that came out of their nightmares to focus on. The shield I'd erected was above me. It prevented bullets from hitting the spiders. It didn't stop anyone from coming after me. And at this point, everyone had realized I was involved with what, to their eyes, were monsters. At least five cops were rushing my direction. I looked around the blood coming out of my cut spurting with each twist of my arm as I tried to get a plan in place. I gave up and KO'd the first group running at me. Keeping up a shield and sending out a wide KO stressed me, and the shield wavered. When they realized that distracting me would make the shield drop, I saw them move the guns to point at me. When did my life become this? I reached for the elements again, the easiest to control right now with my mind scrambling. I pulled on air, creating hurricane force winds to whip around me. When the flimsy snack building under the leg started to wobble, I lowered the strength, keeping myself in the eye of the storm. More and more, the responders were pointing at me and talking on their radios or phones. I had to figure this out fast. A slash of pain, and then a warm, furry body was helping to support me, even though I tried to stay in the center, the wind was still strong. Carolyn, I had to yell over the screaming of the wind. Can you get them to come down here so we can leave? If I had known their names or something, I could have tried to mind-speak them. But I didn't, and I doubt they knew who I was. His tail lashed back and forth across my leg as he stared up. They are coming, but you'll need to drop the winds. I sighed, but did so heading to where they would arrive. Their multiple legs were quick work of the distance, and the few people remaining fled as they came down, heading toward us. Come on, we'll get you home. I called out as Caroline created a rip to their home. They raced toward us and the gate to home. I peered around at the devastation I'd caused. Lots of people still unconscious, torn up ground, raging cops, and was the tower tilting? The last bit of earth I'd pulled up and lifted one edge of it. That wasn't good. I turned to head in when pain lanced through my body, and I cried out as it felt like a red-hot needle went through my shoulder. Corey! The words were a roar in my head. Long, multi-jointed, fuzzy legs grabbed me and pulled, and the noise, shouting, gunshots, sirens, all disappeared as I was yanked to the other side of the rip. I lay on the ground and sobbed as my body convulsed in pain. Chapter 44 
breaking news. Lead rogue mage hunter Archmage Michelle Lupian Saldua has executed Dennis Strickfield. In a showdown distressingly similar to the events that formed the basis of the movie and the career of Scott Randolph, Dennis was executed in a mall where he shopped for clothes in a disguise. Archmage Saldua severed his spinal cord with a brake pattern. The rogue dropped, and no one else was put in danger. CNN Mage Focus The tumultuous attention of the village I lay in the middle of was a mix of joy and horror as children raced to their parents and beings raced to help me. I just lay there trying to breathe, and any movement hurt so much I wanted to throw up. Laying still and breathing sounded like an excellent idea. Tarzan is coming. Esmir is coming. I'm going to get Joe as soon as Malkin is here. Caroline whispered the words in my mind, his tongue scratching against my face, his body all but vibrating with stress. Uh Uh-huh, I murmured, not willing to react any more than that. Caroline, what happened? Esmir's voice was a hiss in my mind, and I retched then cried out and tried to stop the cycle of pain-driven retching, which caused yet more pain. Shut, but children rescued. We need human hands to get the bullet out. He paused for a long moment. Tersane would be helpful. All of this went on around me, but I could barely concentrate. Labor had been hard, even painful. But this? Every move set off new burning pain, and I kept swallowing down my bile, Every time I opened my eyes, there was a new being staring down at me, ones I didn't know. I closed my eyes again. I will call Tersane. Corey is a lord, a herald. This is not a favor, this is saving ourselves. Esmer's words were sharp. Do that. I must get Joe. A slash of pain, and I cried out, reaching for Carolian, and only causing more pain. Did he leave me? Tears flowed down my face from the pain and the thought he was gone. I couldn't live without him. Hush, little one. He will be back. Trusted human hands are better for this. Tursane is coming. Esmir lay next to me and a purr rumbled from her, deeper and throatier than Carolian. It vibrated my body, but the sensation was soothing, not painful. Promise? I croaked out wanting nothing more than to close my eyes and just quit. But I had promised to close the rift. I needed to. My mind locked on that rift. Rift. Close. Corey, no. You are weak and hurt. Esmir sounded alarmed. That made no sense. I closed rifts all the time. Well, close. No more danger. I whispered. I had so much blood to offer, it coated everything. It coated me. Why? Why was there so much blood? I hadn't cut myself that badly, had I? The world wavered as I moved, and I convulsed as the pain radiating from my upper body made everything spin. I'll just lay here. No stand, I said. My eyes closed as the whirling world made vomiting even harder to resist. I reached out and took all that blood, so much blood, and offered it to magic. Magic inhaled it, taking it all, and the rift snapped shut. My head lolled toward Esmir. See? Closed. Silly child. Tursing could have closed it. Multiples working together could have closed it. Though it might make your wounds easier to deal with. But we need that bullet out bullet? Why would a bullet be here? Denizens didn't have guns. Humans had guns. Oh. Guns. Oh. Shot? I'm shot? Yes. And if I could rend that being that did this to you limb from limb, I would. Then I would roast them with some of the hot sauce my son likes so much. Esmir snarled in my mind. I giggled whimpered, then giggled again, this time not letting my body move, at the idea of Esmir roasting someone over a fire while basting the dead body with hot sauce. 
it wasn't cannibalism if they weren't human, right? Two slashes of pain. Then my Carolyn was next to me, licking my face. You're back. I have Joe and Sable. You didn't leave, I asked, trying to lift my arm to touch him. Not even magic would stop me from being with you always, he replied. Gory, what the fuck? You're shot. What happened? Joe leaned over, peering at me as her hand touched my forehead, then moved to my shoulder. Please shot me. I'm in trouble, but couldn't let them hurt the kids. Paris is going to be so mad. The words barely made sense in my own mind, but before I could explain, Joe poked at my shoulder and I cried out. Let me bite her. It will remove the pain, numb the area, and help her body to restore blood, Tursane said, and I saw her briefly before I closed my eyes. Corey, Corey, can you hear me? I opened my eyes again, my hand on Carolyn's body where he lay next to me. Hi, Tursane. Where's Sable? I'm here, love. Let's get you fixed up, Sable said, appearing in my field of vision. While Corey would be better at this, given her training, I can tell the bullet didn't go all the way through, but I think it's almost out the other side. I'll need a scalpel. Sable sounded calm. My partners were the best. Her bucket. We'll need to roll her. Joe responded, just as controlled. Darsane, you're first. This is going to hurt as soon as we move her. Sable said, her voice smooth, but the hand that touched my face was trembling. Silly. I would be fine. How couldn't I be? They were here to help me. Corey, my snakes are going to bite you. Twice now, and twice after we have the bullet out. Terse moved very close to my face, her endless eyes searching mine. I saw the snakes bouncing up and down, agitated, darting out to lick me in quick little snake kisses. Okay, bite away. I cut myself with scalpels all the time. How bad could a bite hurt? A scream ripped out of me as two sets of pain lanced me right where it already hurt the most. I clamped my mouth shut and fought back the sobs. I hated crying. I never solved anything. I know, little one, but breathe in and out three times. Then the pain should subside. She said as she gave me a soft touch to my nose. In, out. Her voice pulled me with it, and I breathed in and out. Again. In. Out. The pain, which had been lava battering at my walls, cooled, pulled away, and I took in a breath that while it hurt, it only hurt. Hurt I could handle. With one more in and out cycle, my fourth, I opened my eyes, the pain no longer pulling at pushing at everything. Through there existed a slight fuzziness at the edges of my mind that said drugs, but I could handle that. Esmir was on my left side, Caroline on my right, Joe on my left side near my head, while Sable mirrored her on my right. Tersane bent over me from above. Everyone stared at me. Ow. Joe snorted. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Anything else hurt besides the bullet in your shoulder? Right now, nothing hurts. That part is rather nice, I retorted, but I wasn't stupid enough to try to sit up or even move. Answer the question, Joe scolded, but the worry in her tone overlaid everything. I closed my eyes, running a scan, wiggling toes, tightening muscles. No, I said after a minute, just that. How bad is it? It's not good, she paused, a heavy sigh slipping out. <sighs> I really should take you to the hospital, Joe said, her voice slow. Let's not, if our friends will help, let's do that first, I said quickly. The last thing I wanted was all the police reports that went with a gunshot. The bullet didn't go all the way through. I'll need you to move your arm so I can cut it out she warned. I felt Sable's hand tighten on mine. It's okay. Tersane has the good drugs. It doesn't hurt. 
I could feel my smile was a bit loopy, but that was okay. Joe dug one of the sterile scalpels out of my pants pocket and had me sit up. I turned my head to see the hole in my shoulder. Ouch. Nothing broke? With gentle hands, Joe manipulated it. Not that I can see. It looks like it hit and lodged under the scapula. I'll need you to lift your arm so I can pull it out. My head tilted in acquiescence, or the happy drugs. Either way, it didn't matter. Joe had never been an EMT, but both her and Sable earned their first aid certs and basic life saving, and I knew if my life was at risk, she would have knocked me out to take me to the doctor. It was the oddest feeling, the blade sliding into my flesh, yet no pain. I could feel the pressure and the sensation of my flesh being pulled apart, and I knew I should be screaming in pain. Tersing, if you sold your venom, you'd be a millionaire. This is amazing. She watched from a distance, an odd look on her face. I will take that under advisement. Her eyes darkened as Joe pulled something from my shoulder. This is normal to the way humans fight? Very, I said dryly as Joe wiped the area clear, first with alcohol, then water. I'm lucky they weren't using bigger caliber bullets or that it didn't hit someplace more fragile than my shoulder. If this had hit my heart, my head, my stomach, I'd probably die. The village, who apparently had been listening to us intently, went silent as this information disseminated through them. That is more than terrifying. I kept thinking you were overstating the weapons. After all, I can cause storms and earthquakes. She said slowly, The last time I truly fought either with or against man, you were still using swords and bows. Yeah, that's the problem. For most mages, it takes a minute to figure out what they want to do. Show it to magic, pay the price, then do the spell. I'm good in that I've done it enough, it takes me seconds. 10 to 15? A decent shot can fire a gun in under 5 seconds. Oh. Tersane all but whispered, arms crossed over her breasts, hugging herself tightly. All done. Esmir, Gerlian, you're up. You too, Tersane. Cory, more bites and licks. Joe had her voice artificially bright, and I glared at her from the side. You're enjoying the pain a bit too much, I accused. What pain? You can feel any. She said back with a smile. She and Sable held me while Carolyn licked the front wound and Esmir on the back, while Tersane had a snake bite me on each side. The venom should promote healing and clotting, as well as keep it pain-free for the next day or so. Though, if she moves, it is because it doesn't hurt. She might make it worse. Usually we tie up wounds to remind ourselves that we are injured. She had pulled back to watch me. Days? Wow, yeah, you could create a thriving business selling snake venom, Sable said as I was buffeted between two huge cats, their rough tongues dragging across my skin. I'd whine, but I knew the roughness would fade in hours and the saliva would make me heal much faster. Thank you, I said when everyone was done and they had helped me to my feet. My head was a bit spinny, and all I wanted was a very, very long nap. The gorgon that had claimed one of the children approached, giving a nod of respect to Tersane as she did so. Earth Lord? Her voice was hesitant, and the baby gorgon was right behind her, clinging to the tail tip. Hey, is everyone okay? I forgot to ask. I waved at my shoulder. That distracted me more than it should have. They are okay, right? The Gorgon glanced at my shoulder, then back to me. Yes, they are well. Scared, which I figure will flare off, and soon they will boast of their big adventure. The bit of humor at that statement faded, and she cleared her throat. <clears throat> we did not realize you would be in danger. We knew you were of the earth and figured, as a lord, worst case, and might cost you some trinkets to get them back. We did not know we were sending you to battle. 
Our gratitude is more than we can express. We declare all debts to us cleared. An odd pulse of magic ran through me. I forced myself to straighten, and I nodded. You are welcome. I acknowledged the clearance of a debt. She sagged in relief, and I wrinkled my brow, but it was too much effort to deal with. They slithered off as Tursane and Esmir seemed exasperated with me. What? I demanded. At this point, while I didn't hurt, exhaustion flowed from the bottom of my feet to the top of my skull. Hunger gnawed at me. Food, bath, and bed sounded delightful. Nothing. Continue being you. It is a refreshing change, Tursane said. Go home. I will alert Freya to this matter. I nodded, and Joe and Sable wrapped arms around me. Home? Yes, home. Carolyn opened the way, and we stepped into the house, with me weaving a bit. I shook my head, trying to get the pounding and echoes of sirens to stop. Joe and Sable were staring at the front door. Corey, why are the cops here? Not a clue. I didn't do anything in the United States. I protested as Joe went to answer the door. Chapter 45 Given the attacks we have been facing lately, a new class called Magical Protection is being instituted in all state universities. This class will provide instruction and techniques for offensive and defensive use of magical abilities. This has always been reserved for those mages that enter the military, but given the current situation, we feel the general public needs to know these techniques. It will be open to anyone who wishes to take it, free of charge. Chancellor of University of California System Sable supported me with an arm around my waist while Joe headed to answer the door. I pulled my phone out of my pocket, now that I had a signal again, and the messages and voicemail notifications exploded. Yes? Joe said after she got the door opened up. I looked up as the person at the door started talking. I'm here to pick up Corey Monroe, an order of the State Department. The voice sounded vaguely familiar. And you are? Joe sounded as exasperated as I felt. Today just wasn't going to end, was it? Grab me food, water, and protein drinks, and stuff them in the backpack. I have a feeling I won't be sleeping in my bed. I said in a low voice to Sable. She nodded, grabbing my backpack, leaving me leaning against the stairway wheeling. FBI agent Jake Arnold, I'm here to take Corey Monroe in for questioning. He stated, but I saw him watching me. I stood in a straight line from the front door, so I couldn't hide or pretend I wasn't there. Identification? Joe kept her voice cool, using her body to block him from coming in, her own tattoo easily seen in the afternoon sun. Rather than arguing, he reached into his pocket and pulled out his ID and badge and handed it over to her. She made a show of looking at it, then nodded. Looks legit. Do you have a warrant? Jake cleared his throat. <clears throat> the Secretary of State has requested we collect her for questions regarding her actions in France a few hours ago. Hours? I glanced at my watch, surprised. Apparently the whole mess with me getting hurt and then moderately healed took more time than I thought. I'd left about noon, my time, and my watch told me it was pushing four in the afternoon. And she's supposed to be able to get from France to New York in a few hours? Joe asked archly, both pretending I wasn't standing in the hallway and that my pension for traveling impossible amounts didn't exist. We did point that out to them, but the response boiled down to, go wait for her until she shows up, he said with an apologetic air. Ah, I see. She looked at him for a minute, then called over her shoulder. Are you here? Yeah, Agent, can you let me go pee first and change clothes? 
I asked as I could still hear Sable in the kitchen getting me what I need. Joe moved enough that the agent could walk in and look at me. No offense, ma'am, but while I would advise bringing some clothes with you, I wouldn't change. The way you look right now might help your case. I sighed. (sighs) Give me a minute. I detoured to the hall bathroom and looked at the person in the mirror. She had grass and dirt covering her. Blood soaked her shirt. The gaping hole in the front provided testament that she'd been shot. Across her face and arms were scratches either from Carolyn or the flying debris. Then bright red puncture marks on her neck where Tursane's snakes bit her. All in all, the woman in the mirror looked like a refugee from a war. What have you been doing, woman? You can't keep this going too much longer. I asked. The stranger in the mirror didn't answer, so I used the bathroom, washed my face, and rinsed out my mouth. With luck, Tursane's bites lasted as long as she said they would, or I'd be in trouble soon. I came back out to find Sable, Hamadia, Marisol, the kids, and Carolyn all glaring at the FBI agent. Honestly, the kids looked like they were about to tear him limb from limb. Carolyn just looked annoyed. You can't take our mama Corey. She's hurt. She needs sleep and us protecting her. Jazz insisted. Azul fluttered above her, darting over to me as I stepped out. Hurt? Hurt? Not hurt. I lifted my right arm and ran a finger down the Ketso's belly. I'll be fine. Tursane and Esmir helped. The Ketsos were in awe of Tursane and very respectful of Esmir. Her teaching them how to properly speak had sunk in hard, making her someone they did not want to piss off. I still don't understand why she has to go, Marisol insisted, arms crossed, as Hamadia fretted behind her. Gori, you look awful, she burst out as I stepped back into the hall. I'm okay. Joan Sable were wonderful. They should have been doctors. Matching expressions of revulsion met the statement, and I laughed, cringing as I did so. Can you grab me a change of clothes, including underwear, and then I'll be ready to go. Agent, are we staying local? No, ma'am. They want you in D.C. post-haste. He nodded. Director Luxon said he'd meet you there. If anyone had asked for a poster boy of being in an uncomfortable situation, Jake Arnold was their mascot. I see. Did they say anything else? No, ma'am. Just requested your presence for questioning and talk of an international incident. He shrugged and had sympathy for his role as the errand boy. I'd behave no matter how much I wanted to sleep. Sable headed upstairs while I got hugs from the kids, worried looks from Marisol and Hamadia. Joe pulled me into a hug and held me there until Sable got back and joined it. I swear, Corey, you are going to give me more gray hair than the twins, Joe muttered into my hair. Ditto, Sable said, kissing my temple. Are you sure you have to go? Yeah, I said without elaborating. I didn't know if I'd be coming home. Some of my actions in France carried the death penalty in the United States. A lot would depend on politics, something I didn't like at the best of times. And if they wanted to appease France or not. We'll be waiting, Joe assured me. One last round of hugs and kisses... Then Joe helped me to the agent's car. They got me into the back seat, and Carolyn jumped in on the other side. He lay across the seats, his head on my lap. A minute later, the agent pulled out and headed to the airport. There's a plane waiting for us, ma'am. I figured, I'm just going to close my eyes. He nodded in response, and I petted Carolyn, trying not to fall asleep. My body didn't hurt exactly, but I could tell I'd been injured. The venom kept the pain at bay, and the saliva from the cats had healed the wound to the point it looked like it had happened a day ago, not hours. Don't fight them if they come for me, I said in my mind to Carolyn, bracing myself for the response. I will never let them get near you. We can live with Esmir or some of the other villages, Tursane has an entire city in her caverns. Many would find room for us. Support us. 
His voice was calm, but his tense muscles and flicking tail indicated his pose was an act. And our family? We can't pull the houses with us. You know if I fight, Tersing and the others can't help. I broke the laws. I won't risk the lives of anyone else. The weight of exhaustion pushed against me like a suit of lead, threatening to put me into the ground, never letting me rise. A soft growl was the only response I got. I know, Carolyn, we've always known this was a risk. I'm only surprised I've made it this long. There's a reason most old mages are quiet people that never use magic. I just don't know what to do about the rips that are still occurring. If I'm executed, run home. Make sure that Joe and Sable and the kids have the life they deserve. You deserve that life too. We need to be doing search and rescue, getting fat, playing with children and grandchildren. We have other options. His voice almost begged me to run, to create the life we deserved. I hummed without answering and let the wariness take me. At this point, what else could I do? A soft burn on my arm cut through the haze of exhaustion and glanced down. Three of the four sections of the arm glowed with a silver ink, leaving one empty. Another favor done for Salastra. I stared at it, frowning as the number felt wrong. Oh well, I had to deal with it later. The car slowing at the airport woke me, and they had to help me stagger up the stairs to the plane. There were five armed agents there, and none of them were as nice as Agent Arnold had been. That cat makes one move and I'll put a bullet in it. One of them warned as Carolyn came up the stairs behind me. I pushed myself up from the plane seat I was leaning on. My legs trembled and my head felt light. You lift your gun to him and I'll evaporate all the blood in your body before your finger has time to pull the trigger. He blanched at my promise. The rest of them, including the flight crew, stepped back, giving me space. I nodded and settled down in the seat they gestured at. Carolyn lay on the floor, my feet resting on his back. He wasn't letting me out of his sight, no matter how much he disliked the airplanes. Evaporated blood. That is new, but leaves the flesh a bit too dry to be palatable. I wonder if that would make it, like, unseasoned jerky. I think if you kill them, just boil their organs. It would cook them nicely, and I do enjoy cooked heart. You are incorrigible, I said, my eyes closed as I listened to them moving around me. Just warn me if I need to do something drastic. They are all cowed and sitting far away from you. You would think in this world they were no better than to threaten mages. He sounded disgusted with them. Most people fear death more than I do. At this point, I trailed off. I know, my queen but soon you will solve the problem and will be able to enjoy the rest you deserve. He licked my right hand and then lay quietly as the plane took off. I let myself sleep again, too tired to do much else. The Reagan airport was a reverse of the previous, but now my escort consisted of 10 agents, half of which were mages. They were all grim looks and long hair that didn't look like they used magic at all. My own bias was sneaking up on me as I let them usher me into a car. I sat in the back of Suburban with a row of seats to myself and Carolyn, while an agent sat behind me, probably with a gun drawn ready to shoot me. I didn't care. I just closed my eyes and dozed. This time they took me to the FBI headquarters. Stephen was waiting there as they pulled me, gently, out of the car. Carolyn had snarled a warning any time anyone got too close, was rude, or even looked darkly at me. I ignored them all. Corey, are you okay? What happened? His hand reached out to touch the hole in my shirt. Do we need to get a doctor here? Are you still bleeding? Gunshot. No, mostly healed. I pulled open the shirt to show him the healing wound. How much farther do we have? I'm about out of energy. I hated to admit it, but just standing took more concentration than I liked to admit, and I didn't know what I was going to do when it all went away. Hitting the ground would just hurt me more. 
Besides, Esmere would never let me live it down if I tore open the wound. Sit here. He pointed at a chair in the hall we were walking through. You. He jerked his head at an agent. Go find the wheelchair. Either security or the medical response team should have one. Sir, we've been instructed to make sure she doesn't escape or talk to anyone. One of them protested. And I'm a director and I don't care. If she wanted to kill us all, we'd already be dead. Go. His voice snapped out and the agent blanched, turning and taking off at a run to get me a wheelchair. He sat down next to me, the ring of agents somewhere between an honor guard and an escort to my death expanding outward a bit. What happened? He looked at me with drawn brows and I wanted to sob. I groaned. Mm, can we wait? I suspect I'm going to be telling this multiple times over the next few days. And right now, I don't have the energy to hash it out. It was a debt called in, and let's leave it at that for now. I held my arm out, and he saw the new sections of horn filled in. Uh, interesting. They won't be ready to meet you immediately, and technically, the U.S. Marshals should be babysitting you. Yolanda and I threw our weight around and got modified custody of you, but it's still limited as to what we can do. That means no one else will be able to see you, and they're going to treat you like a prisoner. He kept his voice low, but it was still audible to anyone in the hall. You've worked with us and put your life on the line too much for us to do anything else. Some of us understand your hero. I glanced at him, unsure if the words were for me or our listeners. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. I managed. If I didn't believe I would survive, I'd never make it through the next round of political theater. He fell silent as an agent came back with the wheelchair, and they continued to take me to my prison. Chapter 46 When the government built the FBI headquarters, they included state-of-the-art mage restraining cells— the argument with Hoover was that any mage that had a death wish could escape any arrangement. These were to remind them they were prisoners and make it as difficult as possible for them to escape, but making them suffer would just encourage them to flee at the first opportunity, even knowing escapees would be shot on sight. They set the cells up as tiny bedrooms with a half bath just to make it not too overwhelming. However, Hoover also installed a sniper hole, just in case they tried to run. History of Magic Stephen pushed me down a bewildering number of halls, elevators, and past offices and conference rooms, before showing up in a room with one way in and out, a desk on the same wall as the door, and a series of cells. They were better than jail cells in that they had a bed, a sink, a toilet with half a partition, and a small desk with an office chair. Yet it remained a cell. The cells lined the wall along three sides, creating a U-shape with solid cement ceilings above, and only the desk and one door out. There were no windows or any other obvious means of escape, though nothing would have stopped me from sidestepping away. Really? I gave Stephen a look, ignoring the other agents. Technically, you are in custody, though not under arrest. And while I could justify keeping you in an office closer to where I'm sure they'll have the investigative hearing, given the blood, the exhaustion, the bald scalp, I figured you would prefer to take a nap while you could. I sagged in relief. Sleep sounded exquisite. All I could do was hope the pain-killing venom would still work by the time the Senate or Congress or the Cabinet called me, whomever wanted to lecture me this time. Yes, you must sleep. The healing is going well, but it still takes days, Carolyn said, his tone brooking no argument. Not only did I have zero desire to argue, but they were also correct. It took five minutes to get me in the cell, curl up on the surprisingly comfortable bed with Carolyn on the floor next to me. Then darkness swamped me like a rogue wave, and I submitted with relief. Corey, they demand to see you. 
Carolan's voice warmed through my brain, forcing me to surface from the depths of sleep I'd been in. Gray floors and an altar swam through my brain as I opened my eyes to cement ceilings. I groaned. I ached, but it didn't actively hurt. However, I could feel the pain hiding behind everything, and suspected in a bit I'd either need another bite or I'd be screaming. A few dry swallows and my mouth started working, so I sat up, turning to look outside my cell. Stephen leaned in the doorway, giving me time to reboot my brain. Yeah, I croaked as I winced with every move. The only place I should be right now is in a bathtub. They will kill you. Don't let them kill you. The mantra rattled through my brain as I struggled to stand up. Carolyn was near me, letting me use him as a steadying force. They want to talk to you. You sure you don't want to clean up? He looked at me, a frown and drawn brows creasing his face. Oh no, I want them to see exactly what the consequences are. I don't know if it will help, but I can hope. Though I'll need to eat something on the way. According to my watch, it was 8 a.m., which meant I'd slept through the night, which meant I was going on 36 hours of no shower or clean clothes. Whatever. Maybe they'd think twice about pushing me. I have a breakfast burrito here, he said, turning to pick up three foil-wrapped items. The cafeteria isn't half bad. He watched me with worried eyes. I ignored him and fumbled in my pack for a protein drink. Warm. Blech. And then I reached for the burrito. I felt sticky, my mouth tasted horrible, and the low-level headache didn't help. Carolyn stayed silent, which worried me, but now wasn't the time to ask questions. That, and I figured he had to be as exhausted as I was. More and more people appeared in the halls as Stephen and the quartet of agents got me in a car and then headed to wherever we were meeting the committee. Do you have any idea? I said, but Stephen shook his head in a sharp, jerky motion, glancing at the other two agents and back with us. He had circles under his eyes bigger than mine and grooves along his mouth, proving he'd been up all night. I sighed and ate the second burrito, giving Carolyn a nibble. You hungry? I asked, worried. I couldn't remember the last time he ate. No. Stephen brought me food earlier. Two pounds of grilled chicken with hot sauce. Not as good as feasting on your challengers, but it will suffice for now. He lay at my feet in the large suburban SUV. I managed to muffle my laugh and concentrated on water and food. Any chance of coffee? I'm kind of dying. That comment I figured was safe. No detainee. One of the agents started to snap at me, Stephen cut him off. Yes, Merlin Monroe, I will make sure you get a large coffee with sugar and cream. He glared at the other agent, and they backed off. How long? I asked to give myself some options. Another 15, depending on traffic. The driver answered. I hummed to myself and munched on the next burrito. I was pretty sure there should be some hard-boiled eggs somewhere in my bag if I needed more, but right now I was fine. Carolyn's harness was in there as we'd taken it off in the village. Part of me thought of putting it back on him, maybe the simple version. I'd keep his bowl and treats with me. People were going to be antsy enough as it was. I didn't need to make it worse. Corey? I looked up to see Stephen peering at me. I hummed an encouraging sound, my mouth full. He frowned, glanced at the others, then looked at Carolyn. I sighed. Yes, Stephen, I said mentally, getting what he wanted. It took energy to do this, but he was right here, so it wasn't too draining. Thank you. I'm trusting you're okay, but they are going to be out for more blood. What are you going to do? What exactly happened and why? He looked out the car window, focused on the scenery for all the other agents could tell. I provided a simplified rundown of the situation and what had happened. He shot a brief look at me, and I tugged up my sleeve, revealing the altered tattoo. Well, that is better and worse than I feared. Good part, Paris. Bad part, you. Yeah, 
My reputation is getting ahead of me again. But we as a race need to quit attacking beings just because they are different. If some of them ever truly grew mad at us, we would be in big trouble. Why do you say that? Dragons don't care about our stupid rules, and I'm not sure anything less than a very high-caliber bullet could touch Smog, and that is only if she didn't know it was coming. They are magic users, too. If I can create a shield, so can she. You've become used to Tersane. Do you remember the sec game? At that point, she and the others were terrifying. She's a friend, but she's still a demigod, and for the most part, she finds humans boring. If she or Bob decided they wanted to play with us? Stephen swallowed and made a show of looking at his phone. We would be fucked. I said nothing else. My toes petted Carolyn, who wasn't purring. His awareness was too high, and I didn't blame him. I'd have much rather been at home and eating a meal with my family, not in a car headed to an inquisition. Swallowing a mournful sigh, I consoled myself that Stephen had made sure he had food. It would help with his temper, if not mine. I finished the last bite just as we were pulling around. Already reporters mobbed the area. Is there any place else that isn't reporter-filled? I asked hopefully. No, ma'am. This is the best place. They got me out and into a wheelchair, which was becoming too common in my life, amid shouts of, Corey, what did you do? Corey, how many did you kill? Whose side are you on, the monsters? I ignored all of it, but took a minute to get the harness on Carolyn before I was wheeled inside. My best friend, walking beside me. Remember, no killing anyone, I said mentally, as my fingers stroked his back, our version of hand-holding. Then they had better ensure to not make any threatening moves toward you. He replied back, unconcerned. My mental cringe to his response had my stress ratcheting up. I started scoping out who had weapons and reviewing the law in my head. Just how much trouble would I be in for this? It took another 20 minutes before I found out the level of heat coming down on me. The same jerk who'd run my other hearing sat as the chairman, and the person running the show and the truth teller looked familiar. Senator John Williams, you have the floor the man at the front said. Merlin Monroe, what exactly do you have to say for yourself? His demand over reading glasses brought to mind images of an overbearing teacher. They set me up similarly as last time, at a table with the wheelchair, but this time I was alone. Well, mostly. Carolyn wasn't hiding. He was on a chair next to me, peering around at everyone, it amused me how many people flinched as his gaze raked over them, and I didn't see all my fans in the gallery. In regards to? I asked mildly. Stephen had followed through, and I had a large coffee loaded with sugar and creamer, and it was hot, which helped a lot. They kept these places too cold. Really? You are going to play stupid? Fine. This. He snapped at me and pressed a remote. A screen slid down at one side and taped images of me knocking people out, lifting the ground, Carolyn grabbing a gorgon and disappearing, and then the Chitarians catching me. That part was new to me. I'd been unable to remember anything after the spike of pain that slammed into me. I looked at him and shrugged. What about it? Who are you to interfere in other nations' activities? You jump in and hurt people to rescue monsters. You attack the officers of the law doing their duty. And then you disappear, leaving a mess behind. France has been on the phone with the Secretary of State nonstop, demanding your extradition. He delivered each word like an attack, and I couldn't help but flinch at the last part. Extradition would be bad. There were children in danger. Just because they weren't human children does not mean they weren't in danger. I was obligated to help them. I shrugged and sipped on my coffee, trying to act nonchalant. The only positive part of his rant had been the injured comment. Not dead. That meant I hadn't killed anyone. Children? You mean monsters? He scoffed. You act like they had parents that were worried about them. 
My head snapped up as rage flushed through me, and I glared at him. No, I mean children. Anyone that has a familiar will tell you that even though they aren't human, they are sentient beings, which means the denizens that live in the realms are just as capable of loving their children as we are, and they do. So yes, they were children, and if you can't see that, you're a moron. My temper was rising again, but I didn't care. Fine, they were children. That doesn't justify you attacking officers of the law. He snapped back at me, and my magic urged me to react. I pushed it down and looked at him. And to them, we are the monsters. We were the ones threatening their children. No one was seriously hurt. They didn't come after you. They had children get lost by falling through a rip, something we know happens on our side as well. I will not apologize for rescuing them from their monsters. I gave the panel a bitter smile. After all, humanity has a much better track record of hurting others in larger numbers than they ever have. He glared, but before he could open his mouth, someone else spoke. A woman, though from my seat, I couldn't see her name tag. She at least smiled and nodded at me, though that didn't mean I trusted her. Do you realize Franz is calling for your head? You damaged the Eiffel Tower when you called Earth under it, bent the girders, holding it up. What should we tell them? It sounded like an honest question, and one I didn't have an answer for. Oops. No one laughed, and I sighed. <sighs> tell them in the heat of the moment while in a frantic effort to save children. The placement of the Earth I called to protect both myself and the children was detrimental to the tower. However, unless they would be just as upset if it had been human children I was rescuing, their complaints have no weight. One corner of the woman's mouth tilted up in a smirk as she nodded to me. I will relay the message, but should we give you over to them? I shrugged, trying to be nonchalant. Did my damage fall under anything that creates a valid extradition charge? No she said, just as amused as I was. Then my preference would be no extradition and remember that I am not covered by French law, only American. My pulse was slowing down, but from how hard the senator was fuming, I knew I wasn't in the clear. The committee looked like they might have argued further when both on the panel and in the chamber phones started going off with alarm sirens. It took a minute as various people pulled out their devices, staring at them. A moment later, a man in military undress uniform strode out onto the floor. At this time, we are asking you to disperse. We need to get the elected officials to safety. Please make sure you follow the guides toward the shelters in the basement. His voice was crisp and no nonsense as others streamed after him, headed to the officials. Senators reacted immediately grabbing their belongings in their hands and racing toward the exit while military and security waved them down halls. I wheeled my chair around to find Stephen headed for me in his brisk, take-no-prisoners walk. What is going on? I called out to Stephen. I needed people to get out of the way before I could move the chair. The wheelchair was too bulky. If I tried to walk, I'd just be knocked over. Too risky. The last thing I needed was more injuries. Stephen had made it to me. Rip in DC. Come on, let's get out of here. He grabbed the chair and wheeled me back the way we came. Chapter 47 Attention, MC fans. The government is attacking her again. This time they are trying to keep it as a private hearing, not open to the public. We have an insider who is willing to live stream it on our private website. Please remember to show up so we can make sure we know exactly what the government thinks they can do to our marvelous Corey. Email from the Marvelous Corey fan group. We pushed against the flow of the crowd with the entourage I always seem to have lately. As we moved through the halls, we garnered more than a few looks, but the agents could quell any curiosity with a glance. I needed to learn that skill. What can you tell me about the rip? I asked as we fought to get out of the main traffic. Not much. Creatures coming out, 
but they either aren't sentient or they aren't responding to our attempts at communication. Either option could be accurate. There was an odd tightness to his voice I didn't understand. What aren't you telling me? I kept trying to look back at him and see his face, but the angle made it difficult to see more than his nostrils flaring down at me. Carolyn loped alongside us, doing more to scatter people out of our way than the other agents managed to do. Indira was called in. She should get there shortly, he admitted as we turned a corner. And where are we going? I asked, already knowing the answer. I could see it in the tightness of his shoulders and the other agents. Taking you back to detainment, and then I'm headed that way to see if I can help. He didn't look down at me, just locked his eyes straight ahead, pushing me. No, I let the words slip out. Get me out there. You need me there, and I can help. No time, so it isn't anything to worry about. It would take us 30 minutes to drive there, and that is assuming traffic doesn't lock up. He growled as his feet moved faster, and my wheelchair bounced more. Then there is no reason for you to go, or you let us go and Caroline could get us there in a minute. I almost fell out of the chair. He stopped so fast. You can do that. Take me there now? Yes, Caroline affirmed. Show me where. Stephen took a second to pull us out of the flow of frantic people and pulled up his phone. Here, at the section of the Washington Mall. It's at the base of the Lincoln Memorial. Sir, we can't do that. She's being detained, one of the agents protested. Stephen didn't even bother to look at the agent as he responded. Don't care. You don't like it, report me. But we're going to help protect people. Remember the oath we swore? Defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. If we let the rips continue, we won't have a country left to defend, and she is our biggest weapon. The last words were bitter as he turned my existence into a tool, but I understood where he was coming from. Sir, one protested, but another raised his hand. I think they need us to help with the evacuation. Director Alexen can handle one woman from here. The agent nodded at me with a quick twitch of his head, and then he and the others left. Stephen's shoulders sagged a bit, and I made a mental promise to not cost him this job if I could avoid it. I took a deep breath and stood up. Let's go, Carolyn. It was an order and an act of faith. He never let me down and never would. He flicked an ear at me, but the rip opened. We stepped into the crossroads and the rip closed behind us. The empty grayness of the area, along with the quiet, let me breathe for a moment, some of my stress sloughing off. Stay. He growled at both of us as he opened up a rip. He jumped through and I obediently waited. Aren't you going to go? Stephen demanded. Not until he says I can. He's my partner. I'll wait until he says it's safe to go. I cast a look up at Stephen. He'll let us know. As if in response to my words, Carolyn spoke in our minds. Come. I stepped into the bedlam that was a rip scene, The clothes I wore were still the same from the day before, stained, sweaty, and I probably stink. Not that my nose was working at this point, which meant I fit right in with the chaos. Everyone was yelling, running away from things that chased them. Sirens wailed and the rip hung right above the ground. Have you figured out what has come out? I reached out to pet Carolyn. I should have made him put his harness on, but we didn't have time. The rift opened into a breeding area of woos. They're savage, aggressive, with bites that can kill. What are they? Stephen asked, patting himself and going white. No gun. Forgot they required me to lug it up. I gave him a sidelong glance. You're a mage. Use magic. What do they look like, Carolyn? Large, angry rodents. They're quite tasty when roasted. His tail lashed back and forth as he crouched his ears pricking one way, then another. Can you tell where Indira is? Stephen asked. Maybe, Carolyn replied after a second. We go this way. The rip needs to close. Roos are mindless, but we'll keep attacking until there is nothing left to attack. So kill quickly. Got it. I pulled up my fast kills, usually causing blood to boil or freeze, or easiest, burn out their lungs. I put an action to words as we talked, 
dropping two of them as we followed Carolyn. They were like gigantic rats, closer to the size of large dogs. I could see why Carolyn would enjoy chasing them, but people in general were running around like idiots, including the cops. They shouldn't be causing this much drama for enormous rats. There were so many days I wish Laura was here. She just handled the weird better than most. Let me see if I can close it, I said as Carolyn headed toward a cluster of trees. But I'll need to focus. I can't close the rip and walk at the same time. I think we have time. The roofs are annoying, but not particularly deadly in these numbers. Something about his words made me freeze. Or maybe it was the confusion in the tone. Carolyn, what's wrong? I hurried to catch up with them. There's too much panic for roofs. Why are people screaming and dropping? They're deadly once you've been injured, not before. His head moved back and forth on a swivel, as if trying to track something. Worry about it later. Get me to India first. Stephen's voice was tight and worried, and I couldn't blame him. The place just radiated chaos, and at this point, people should be a bit more blasé about rips. What was going on? Another piercing scream filled the air ahead of us, full of agony and disbelief. We automatically swiveled toward the sound. Wait here. Do not move. His imperative rooted in my feet to the ground, and Stephen wasn't much better. Carolyn, what's wrong? I called as he raced over to the woman that had just collapsed. Voids, take them. He hissed in my brain, a harsh sound that rattled through my mind. I flinched, as did Stephen. Carolyn pivoted the way only a cath could, and between one leap and the next was racing toward us. Asclepius vipers are attacking people. The kill with a single bite. He ran right up to us, spinning around, looking for danger. Corey, close it now, then kill them all. I needed to ask questions. That name sounded familiar, but not as something I associated with deadly. But if you wanted me to focus on this, I would. I turned and looked at the rip, seeking its magic, its power. It wasn't a huge rip, but it opened into an active area of the spirit realm, which surprised me. Whatever. I grabbed and tried to pull it close, and ran out of offerings. Fuck, I muttered. I fumbled in my pants, but they'd taken all my scalpels. Too big of a risk. Carolyn, I need blood, now. He leaped over to me, razor-sharp claws snicking out and with surgical precision drew a deep cut down my extended arm. I sucked in a breath, but the pain was familiar by this point, making it easy to ignore. I grabbed the blood, offering it to magic. She grabbed it with an odd level of greed, and the rip snapped shut. I sagged a bit as the blood vaporized, leaving my arm clean, but more blood welling up. Done. Now what? You must kill all the snakes, Healers in your ancient Greece once used their venom. It was a humane way to kill those that could not save. But these snakes haven't been milked in centuries. When they bite, their venom races through your system, shutting down all your organs. Past the bite, there is no pain, just death. Before you ask, no. There is no way to save someone once the venom enters their bloodstream. The amount of fear and stress in his words had me focusing trying to figure out how to find and kill so many creatures. I didn't practice killing beans, and the soul grab would only work on sentient beans. I need an example to figure out how to isolate them, I said, trying to figure out how to nail down what I needed. One moment. Again, do not move. He was gone before I finished processing the words. Corey, I need to find Indira. Something is wrong. The tension in his voice had me staring at him, but Stephen peered off in the distance toward a stand of trees. I gave my head a shake. I know you need to find her, but give me a minute. I'm working as fast as I can. He glanced at me, but before he could say whatever his eyes heralded, Carolyn came bounding back, a hissing snake in his teeth. This is what you must kill. Quickly! I looked at the snake, a dark brown snake with green and red diamonds alternating down its back, with a viper head and a thick, sinuous body. It hissed and thrashed as it tried to bite Carolyn. He held it firm in his teeth, holding right behind the skull. I pulled on pattern match, 
pulled its pattern, and then just liquefied its brain with a pulse of pattern break. The snake went limp midway through a hiss. That is disturbing, Stephen muttered, looking at the snake that Caroline spat out. It fell to the ground in a pile of lifeless coils. Now do it for all of them. I queried, and Magic responded as if waiting for my request. The price made me wince, but I could and would pay it. Snakes infested the area where the rip had been. A quick flex of my arm refreshed the blood flow, and I offered it up. Magic grabbed, a bit reluctant this time, and I felt a smidge of guilt. By my best guess, I was killing over 200 of these snakes, which in many ways were innocent victims. But I didn't see any other option. A push, a price, and I had killed hundreds of beings whose only crime had been to be dangerous. They're dead, I muttered, my energy sagging. Good. Where's Endure? Stephen stared at Carolyn as if willing him to come up with the answer. This way, he said, bounding away. Stephen raced after him. I hobbled. The energy I needed to run didn't exist. Part of me wanted to crumble to the ground, but the fear in Stephen's voice had infected me. Koi, she was bit. Carolyn's words rung in my head like a bell and gave me a burst of energy from somewhere. Endure, Stephen's voice rang up ahead, fear and anger as I saw his figure drop to the ground and pull a limp form into his arms. I moved faster, trying to get to them, but something told me it didn't matter. It was already too late. Stephen had Indira wrapped in his arms, her bright green blouse garish against his tan suit jacket. He didn't let go as her body racked with shivers. You came, she whispered, her eyes locked on his face. I always will, he said, just as quietly. His eyes darted over toward me. Fix her, he hissed. She can't die. I, I don't know how, I stuttered. Her body stopped shivering, and I reached over to grab her hand. The long, flexible fingers were clammy and stiff. Carolyn, what do I do? My heart begged for an answer that would give me something to stop this. Mourn her, he said privately to me. He walked over and curled up around her, purring as he gave his warmth to her. Publicly, he said, Stephen, love her. Not even Tursing can save her. These snakes were meant to provide a quick death. There was no way to stop the process. No, I don't accept that. Corey, you're the most powerful mage that has ever been. Heal her. His words were a demand, a plea, a soul screaming for salvation. I reached in, pulling on the lessons I'd learned so long ago. If anyone could do it, it was me. My magic dove into her body, and I offered recklessly, the blood that seeped from my wound vaporizing before it touched the air. Stephen, marry me, Indira said quietly, her voice so soft that I had to strain to hear her. Forever and always, he said, leaning down to press his lips against her. I was waiting to ask. So was I. I waited too long. I'll always love you, Indira managed each syllable coming out softer and softer. Corey? His voice broke as he begged, and I reached, I offered, and I tried. I repaired her organs, replenished her blood cells, bolstered the synaptic processes, and nothing I did was enough. Her body failed faster than I could repair it. She wasn't hurting. Her body just shut down as the magic venom raced through, and everything just stopped in its wake. I love you, Indira whispered and closed her eyes, her body sagging as her life fled the venom that had taken everything she was. Indira? Indira? Stephen shook her lightly, and Carolyn quit purring. Instead, he wrapped around her, giving what comfort he could to the body that had seconds before been someone we loved and the man who still loved her. Indira, no! His grief shattered the air, 
and his magic did more than that. Chapter 48 Rips of magic across the globe, something we could have prevented if we had shunned magic from the beginning. Humans were not meant to play with the power of the gods. As you wail and mourn those who have died, remember, it is your fault. If we had shunned that which was not ours to meddle in, our world would still be hale and whole. Eat the regret you sowed, and know the blame rests on your shoulders. Final blog on the Freedom from Magic website. His magic snapped out. Though a Merlin, his primary branch was order. Stephen's strengths lay in pattern, earth, and air. Wind picked up as the ground beneath us began to shake. It was known that a grieving mage was the most dangerous creature, topped only by a scared mother who was a mage. Trees began to topple as the earth shook harder, and I saw cracks starting to run across the ground as his magic lashed out his grief. I wanted to sob, scream out my own loss, but fear of losing him too drove me into action. If he couldn't, the responders would have no option but to kill him. His blind fury made him deadly. Already people were headed this way. Carolyn, open a portal. We need to get him out of here. I screamed over the sound of the rising wind. The calf nodded at me, his ears down and whiskers flat against his face. A portal opened behind where Stephen still clutched Indira's limp body to him. I lifted the ground beneath them and tumbled them in, the sudden motion disrupting his anger. I dove in after them, Carolyn following as he snapped it shut behind us. My ass hit cold gray stone and I blinked to find ourselves in the council chambers. There wasn't time for much more than a surprised, huh, to cross my mind before Stephen was on his feet, raging at me. This is all your fault. If you figured this out, done your fucking job, she wouldn't be dead. Every word hit me with the force of a knife to the gut, and I fought not to cry out at the emotional pain. Carolyn growled, but Stephen didn't notice, advancing on me with grief-fueled rage in his eyes. Stephen, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. My voice broke on the words, and I fought to remain standing as my own grief and sorrow threatened to undo me. Sorry? Sorry? That doesn't change anything. His eyes were dilated wide with rage and grief. If you figured it out, you were smart. Why did you let this happen? Every word was punctuated by the ground rocking, throwing me and Carly into the ground, even as he pulled more to him, protecting Indira's body as he cracked open the council floor. I'm sorry, I sobbed out and I hit him with the strongest KO I had, pulling blood out of the still-bleeding wound. Stephen collapsed with a muffled groan and lay in a heap on the split council floor. I collapsed next to him, sobbing, raging, screaming. Why? Why her? You want me to fix this? Show me how to fucking fix this! I started sobbing, holding my hands over my face, as I faced the loss of Indira and probably Stephen's friendship. He'd never care about me again. How could he? He was right. If I'd figured this out, Indira wouldn't be dead. Tears streamed down my face, each one draining me of moisture and energy that I really couldn't afford to lose and I didn't care. Tears, grief, rage all poured out of me in a stream and magic didn't care. Time froze as I raged against the unfairness of the universe. Why sent me to an impossible task? Just show me how to fix it. I'd do anything, anything to stop this madness. Glory. Carolyn's voice nudged against my mind. I ignored him. Glory, look. He insisted, nudging me with his nose. At what? My dead friend? the friend that now hates me. What am I supposed to look at? I didn't bother to lift my head from my hands, my face buried in an attempt to avoid the consequences of my failure. Corey, look. 
Carolian insisted. He shoulder-bumped me, throwing me off balance. I fell onto my side and glared at him. What? What is so important that I can't grieve? I all but shouted the words, wanting someone to understand my anger, fear, sorrow. There is a staircase to caverns, he said simply, turning to look at one of the huge cracks in the floor. I followed his gaze to catch my breath as the gaping wound in the council chamber, slashing through the ring of the chairperson, revealed a set of worn stairs leading down. Familiar worn stairs. A familiar stone. Light that burst out from memories that had never been mine. Could it? My tears still ran down my face, but slowed as I blinked and tried to focus on what I was seeing. I leaned forward on my hands, peering down the sloping stairs that glowed with an eerie light, stairs no one had ever mentioned or even hinted at. I have to go, I said as I forced myself up on wobbly legs. With effort, I managed to stay standing, the backpack a lead weight on my body and soul. I will come with you, Carolian said, pushing up against me. No, the words were out of my mouth without a thought. He snarled back at me, his face too close, and I realized I'd tilted down to him. With a force of will and desperation, I yanked myself back up to standing, letting the pack act as an anchor and balance. Carolyn, you have to stay here. You need to make sure Stephen doesn't wake and cause issues. You need to explain if anyone comes. You're the only one I trust to do this. He didn't back down a long hiss and lashing tail proving he didn't buy it. So I went for the metaphorical jugular. And if something happens to me, you are the only being that can take care of Joe and Sable. Not to mention the twins. Carolyn, you have to be there for them. If anything, his snarling hiss got louder, but his tail dropped between his legs, and he crouched down next to the limp body of Stephen. If you die... He trailed off, unable to finish the sentence. If I die, I will know you love me and will make sure our family never has to fear anything. He whined, a long, low sound that brought tears to my eyes, and I closed them to fight the emotions it elicited. But I will be back. I will, I assured him. I knew I was probably lying, but he needed to believe me, at least right now. Go, scream for me and I will come. Not even the gods shall stop me. His voice held absolute certainty. I didn't push. I will, I said, and in the same breath, I turned and headed down the stairs. In the memories, Shira had flown down them. I had to walk. The cool walls let me lean against them for support, and every five steps I had to stop and convince myself I could do this. There weren't any other options that I knew of, though I had zero idea what this entailed. The stairs twisted and kept sloping down, but they grew warmer rather than cooler. Evidence as to the existence of the volcano. Just when I was sure I'd have to sit down and rest... My legs were shaking and vision had gotten blurry. The stairs stopped at the entrance of a large room with an altar at the end. Working on lowering my heart rate and breathing, I leaned against the doorway and examined the room. It didn't strike me as a place for traps or hidden objects, but I knew it held the answers to the puzzle I'd been fighting to find for so long. With shaking legs, I moved further in until I stood in the center of the chamber. Remnants of memories shown me what Shira had seen versus what I saw now, and it was almost an exact match. An altar lay in front of me, with three chalices standing above each of the classes of magic. Each goblet was the same shape, a large, bulbous bowl tapering down to a stem that was simple, then a wide base, ensuring it would not tilt easily. But there the similarities ended. Order was silver and shiny, with diamonds surrounding the base of the goblet. Chaos swirled with rainbows, 
cycling through all the colors, then fading to black before starting over. Spirit looked like opal, milky, soft pastels, creating an elegant, fragile thing. Above each of them, magic swirled and pooled and somehow became liquid, dripping drop by drop past sigils and runes into each chalice, leaving it brimming with magic. Images of Zenobia in those final moments. Bolstered by Shira and pulled to me by Sol, the imprint of the last actions here. I watched as she called on magic and then dumped the liquid over her, bathing in the magic of each realm. At first she glowed and her smile was radiant, and then it faded away, her hands clutching at her body as magic ate into her, dissolving her. I watched her scream as magic lashed out, the power exploding from her as she vanished into nothingness and the entire cavern vibrated. That obviously wasn't the way to do it, I muttered. I looked at it, trying to figure out what in the world I could do. Carolyn, is Stephen still unconscious? I asked, not taking my eyes off the alluring goblets. Yes, is everything okay? His response was instant, and I felt better, though to feel good I need a shower and clean clothes. Maybe I'm not in danger. I stared at the goblets. Screw this. I'm the Herald, but that doesn't mean I need to do this blind. Tersane Salistra, Bob. I found the key, but I don't know what to do. Can you come here? I'm at the council chambers. Hurry. I sent to all of them and tried to brace myself for the responses from Salistra and Bob. The sensation of a questioning sound caressed my mind, then short responses of yes that didn't hurt too much. I walked around the altar, not touching anything, just looking. It was made of the same stone as the floor, and whoever had carved or raised it had been much better with calling earth than I. I'd never thought about raising carved stone. It might be a fun idea for later. If there was a later. Magic in tangible form was odd and creepy, yet I wanted to touch it, bathe in it. The imprints of the past managed to kill that desire without much effort. A silver chime echoed down the hall of the stairs. The lords are here. They say you summoned them, Carolyn told me as the chime continued getting closer. Thank you. I sent back and turned to watch as Tersane slithered out, followed by Salistra, whose every step chimed like a bell with her silver hooves against stoned floor. Then Bob, his oozing, shapeless form puddling at the bottom of the stairs. You found it, Tersane said, looking around, her snakes tight against her head. I guess. I know this is where Zenobia severed everything, though I'm not sure how. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I waved my arm to encompass everything. You look ill. Why are you ill? Salistra's sharp voice sliced through my mind, and I shuddered at the slash of pain. Rescuing children from your village, from a rip, and then I've been using too much magic. She doesn't do anything for free. Salistra froze, teeth bared at me. For a long moment, she just stared at me, but I felt like she was looking through me, not at me. Ah, the debt. I see. You've repaid most of your transgressions. Only one left. I shivered at those words, but try not to let it show. Instead, I changed the subject. Any clue what I need to do? Tersena moved over to spirit and stared at the chalice full of liquid magic. Her body went rigid and all her snakes went limp. Tersain? I said, starting to move toward her, but she lifted her left hand, holding it out to me. Pax! I am. Okay. Salistra, Bob, will you see if you learn what I just learned? Salistra moved over and dipped her horn in the liquid of order, while Bob dipped a pseudopod into chaos. They both changed as they stood there, then pulled back, looking at each other. I sensed a fast and furious conversation that I was not invited to. If the words from Bob and Salistra didn't hurt so bad... 
I might have been more offended. So, it is agreed, Tersane said out loud, and I jerked my head back to the three lords. The other two nodded, and then they all looked at me. I took an involuntary step back. This wouldn't be good. What is agreed? I looked between the three of them. You must choose, Tersane said. She must have seen the incomprehension on my face because she continued after a moment. Magic is at a crossroads. You must choose which magic survives. Her voice was suspiciously flat as she said that. What do you mean, survive? She means, Harold, that you will decide which of our realms continue in conjunction with Earth. The amount of contempt in Salstra's voice slashed as deep as her words. I am tempted to call in my final debt and demand you choose order. Tersane's snake started hissing. And I am the godmother of her child. Her voice icy. Did I not send the cath to her? Bob's voice, as always, was the worst, and I couldn't contain a low grunt of pain. I lifted up my hands, silencing all of them. Fuck that shit. I'm not letting anyone die or disappear. Tersane's voice so full of sorrow that I almost cried, responded, You must choose a chalice and drink from it. Then that realm will merge with Earth. That makes zero sense, but I'm still not choosing. I snarled at them. I have to drink, right? The magic will do whatever shit she wants to do, and the rips will stop? Essentially, Tersane said, did you know this is where it would all end? I stared at each of them, anger bubbling up in me. No, not until I touched magic. You can see for yourself. She waved at the chalices. I moved over, fear and anger lending me energy. Leaning one hip on the altar, I placed my right middle finger in spirit, my left in chaos. Knowledge filled me, whispers of healing, togetherness, and the urge to drink my fill. I yanked my fingers out and glared at the altar. See, you must choose. Tersane's voice forced me to turn around, to push the urges out of my mind. Corey, it is okay. You are the herald. This is what magic wanted. Salastra didn't say anything, but the sharp chime of her hoof striking the floor declared her anger and concern. You are all overly melodramatic. I don't pull that shit. I need to drink? Fine. But I'm not choosing. I snarled back. I slipped off my pack, my knees almost buckling as the weight left me. I dug inside for Carolyn's bowl. A bit of cast saliva wouldn't hurt me. At this point, I was pretty sure I had him in every cell of my being. What are you doing, Harold? Salister's voice cut like an epee into my mind but I ignored her. I set the bowl on the altar and carefully picked up spirit, poured the liquid into the bowl. The bowl I used for him was an old mixing bowl, so it had measurement lines. I poured a cup of each chalice into the bowl. The cavern seemed to quake as if waiting. Once I had three cups in there, I dug into my pack and pulled out a bottle of water and added a cup. Picking it up carefully, I held out the bowl to the three lords. All realms and earth, equal amounts of what allows life and magic. To magic. I didn't tell Carolyn what I was doing. I just picked up the bowl and began to drink. The question was, would I live to ever see him again? I'd seen what happened to Zenobia. I just hoped the pain wouldn't be too bad. Flavors I couldn't place swirled past my tongue. Some I chased after, sweet and delicious, Others I shied from, dark and bitter, but I drank, feeling the magic well and bubble, but I kept drinking. The last drops passed my lips and I pulled the bowl away from my mouth with a gasp. My head was spinning with new sensations. It is done. I choose everyone. The words sounded like a gasp as I felt magic surging. I love you. I sent to everyone with the image of Zenobia dissolving fresh in my mind. The lords stared at me with horror or surprise. 
A horse and a blob weren't very emotive. What have you done? Tersane whispered. I didn't have a chance to answer as magic extracted her price. She pulled it out of me, shredding me from the inside out. My knees gave, but I didn't even notice the pain of the impact as the rest of me screamed. Then it reversed, and from each chalice a stream of magic bubbled up and flowed like a river torn me. About a foot from my body, they blended into a fire hose of magic that impacted into me. Cory! Tersing cried out, and she headed over to me. At the same time, Carolyn's voice echoed in my mind. Cory! I couldn't respond, couldn't think, couldn't breathe. All I could do was experience agony. Tersane's hand touched me, and where her hand rested, pain stopped. Oh, her voice was soft, so soft only my need to focus on anything other than the pain let me hear it. Then her voice whispered to me, Cory, I regret I will not be able to fulfill the final favors I owe you. Then, in a louder, much clearer voice, she stated, I accept the price. I will pay the price for spirit. She moved and stepped into the flow from the spirit chalice. The pain ebbed, and I turned my head to look at Tersane, whose hand had slid until she just touched the fingers of my right hand. Her body arched back, and her mouth gaped open in a scream. Her snakes had all attacked her, biting hard, pumping venom into her body. I knew they were attempting to lower her pain. A wiggling in my arm grabbed my attention. Not pain, but so uncomfortable it still registered. The snake that had been my tattoo wiggled out of my skin and slithered up my arm to Tersane's hand, then continued up until it joined its brethren, teeth sinking into her neck. No, I stuttered, but the howling of magic swallowed my protest. Really? Really? Salistra's sharp tone cut through, offering a different flavor of agony, and I clung to it. I will not be less than you. Cory Monroe, your debt to me is declared paid in full. Her horn sliced across my arm, a ribbon of liquid fire, but a scratch compared to everything else I experienced. I accept. Order's price shall be mine. Her words were a roar of defiance, and the pain level dropped as Salistra screamed, standing in the flow from order. I knelt on the ground, tears streaking my face, drool dripping out of my gaping mouth as swallowing was past my abilities. At this point, I just sobbed as I tried to remember how to breathe. Let the pain end, please. Then chaos shall be no less. Thank you, Harold, for your courage. I accept the price for chaos. Bob's words tore through me, but I had no breath left to scream. Black tar surrounded me, and the pain dropped from incapacitating to agonizing. Bob moved into the flow, his being flaring white as magic impacted, then filtered through his substance. Standing between me and the magic, it changed, becoming less and more at the same time. The three lords shimmered and sparkled while they screamed in my mind and in my ears, the same agony they were sparing me from. Somehow, the magic became calmer, less aggressive, as it filled me to bursting. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to change everything. Carolyn, I called out, my voice inaudible over their screams. I tried again. Carolyn, Yes, his voice instant in my mind. It isn't enough. I tried not to sob as pain washed me, but it was so much less than it had been, and that was the problem. I need the Phoenix Stone. Now! He didn't argue. I don't know if I would have had the strength to convince him. A minute later, he placed the cold stone in my hand. Thank you. I sobbed out. This has to work. It has to. Carolyn curled up around me, supporting me. I will never leave you, my queen. 
I took solace in his warm fur and solid weight as I raised the phoenix stone into the stream of magic. For one blissful second, the pain stopped, and I began to sag as the feeling of being torn apart vanished. The stream went from a solid stream of gray-blue into a rainbow kaleidoscope of colors. It flared up, then raced forward to impact me. It filled every corner, and I knew I was screaming, but I couldn't hear it. It wasn't recognizable as human as the magic washed through me and changed me. Every cell felt like it was full to bursting. I felt like it had to leave me, and I let go of everything. I gave myself over to magic. The last sight I saw was magic bursting from me, hitting the walls, the earth shook, and something popped deep in my soul. The light and pressure lasted an eternity, yet only a few seconds. Then everything went dark. Chapter 49 Around the world, all the rips have snapped shut. There are reports that the permanent rips at Area 51 are gone. A worldwide quake caused damage across the globe, but not insurmountable damage. Reports are still coming back on the death toll, but it seems minimal as few buildings were destroyed. Geologists say having a global six-point earthquake isn't possible, yet that is what has been seen. GPS is going haywire, and all the governments are refusing to comment. Oddly, the only information we have is from a few familiars, who have stated the world and realms are together again. All thank the Herald. CNN Anchor Corey, a wet nose and tongue brushed at my cheek, and I opened my eyes. Carolyn's emerald orb stared back at me. Are you okay? He kept licking me, on parts that should have had clothes between his tongue and my skin. I lay on my back in the cavern, the rough-hewn stone above me, groaning. I pushed myself up to a seated position and waited for the world to stop spinning. The walls still looked the same. The bowl I'd used sat untouched on the shattered altar, and all my clothes were gone. Remnants of fabric lay on the floor next to me. An image of the three lords, dissolving into nothing, jerked my spine rigid as I turned, seeking them. But nothing remained, not even dust, to show where they had been. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't process this all yet. Instead, I stared at my arm, trying to figure out why they looked wrong. My arms were thin, but the skin intact with my offering wound completely healed. But it still looked wrong. Corey. Stephen's voice came from behind and to my left. I leaned my head back to look at him out of the corner of my eyes. He stood in the chamber, eyes wide, lines on his face from tears and stress. He came forward, pulling off his shirt. Can you stand? I think so. Leaning on Carolyn, I staggered to my feet, a breeze brushing against my naked body. Another glance and I realized why my body looked so funny. I had a slight glow, and my tattoos from the lords were gone. I touched my arm where the snake, horn, and whiskers had existed. Now only pale, glowing skin existed. Stephen slipped his shirt on me. It hit me about mid-thigh. It gave me some modesty, but it barely registered. What happened? We asked each other at the same time. A soft laugh escaped. <sighs> I'm not sure. The world shook and the best thing I can say is it felt like something snapped back in place. If you've ever had a dislocated joint and it pops back into place, that was what it felt like. The world snapped back into place. His voice was hoarse. But I know Indira is still gone. His grief was at the forefront, not the rage. I know. 
I'm sorry. I couldn't save her. Tears welled back up as I tried to swallow them down. It wasn't your fault. I shouldn't have blamed you. I just... He trailed off, waving his hand in the air, avoiding looking me in the eyes. Yeah, I get it. I'm not sure what happened, but... But... The lump formed larger and harder. I forced another swallow, wanting to gag at what I needed to say. Tersane, Salastro, and Bob are gone. They offered themselves to magic. They saved my life by their death. I don't understand, Stephen said softly, as he wrapped his right arm around me on my left, Carolyn by my right side. Together, we walked to the stairs, then climbed them at a glacial pace as I explained what had happened. I had no injuries, but exhaustion soaked me, like my blood had turned to dust. Even the pumping of my heart and breathing seemed a laborious effort. Carolyn held me up, his tail lashing, and I knew I needed to ask him what he'd seen. But for the moment, the stairs were all I could focus on. We stepped up into the broken chamber and I froze. My eyes locked on the shadows slicing away from the open wall. The wall looked onto a lawn where Smog would sit, the green lawn that glowed in direct sunlight. Is that sunlight? My words sounded echoey to my ears, and the possibility I might still be in a dream or memory occurred to me. Or am I seeing things? It is sun. Carolyn sounded just as shocked as I felt, and the three of us moved out onto the grass and looked up. Above us, a blue sky with white clouds and a yellow sun shone down. And all the time I'd ever been to the realms, it had always been a diffuse light, never anything direct. But now, the sun warmed my skin. Can you get your mother? I wanted to say Anne Tursane, but I knew that wasn't possible. Not anymore. Yes he said in a soft whisper, as shocked as I was. Let me sit, I told Stephen as my legs were already threatening to buckle. Carolyn, can you check on Joe and Sable? The kids, Chris, Charles, everyone, are they okay? Even saying that threatened tears. There were too many beings that weren't okay, and Indira and Tursane were at the top of that list. I will check. As Mir said she would come, he sat down next to me, letting me use him as a pillow as I stared up at the impossibility of a sky. Huh, my cell phone works, Stephen muttered. He'd sank down next to me. I blinked at him, but didn't know what to say. Cell phones didn't work in the realms. Everyone is fine, but the news is exploding. Wait, What? Carolyn jerked up a bit, his head tilting. Carolyn? I touched him, breath caught in my throat as I waited for another attack. I couldn't handle anymore. I couldn't. So many dead. Beans I loved. I couldn't lose anyone else. Esmir says she can't come. The realms are gone. There's no way to move through the realms. I stared at him unsure of what he meant. The realms are gone? But she's okay? I needed reassurance that she was fine. She is fine. There was a huge quake. Then the realm jolted, and they were somewhere else. She says everyone is staring at the sun and marveling at the feeling of it on their skins. Stephen spoke in a distracted voice. The news is going crazy. They say new land has appeared and the GPS is inaccurate across the world. He kept flipping through his phone. Any rips? That was my priority still. Not in the last hour, but we've had longer lulls. The question is, where are we? No clue. Can you go get my pack? I need food and water. Then maybe my brain will start working. I was staring at the trees. 
trees I'd never seen on Earth before. But then maybe I just didn't recognize them. Yeah, give me a minute, he said as he got up. My phone had been in my pocket when I went into the cavern. I assumed it had been fried or disintegrated with my clothes. I leaned back against Carolyn, enjoying the warmth of the sun. We lay there, just enjoying being alive for a minute. Do you think I did it? That is what magic wanted? I asked quietly, staring at a cloud drifting across the sky. I am unsure, but the world feels different in a way I cannot put to words. He replied just as softly in my mind. Stephen came back carrying my pack, and we dug into the water and food in there. I felt better after I'd eaten and drank. The change of clothes consisted of underwear, a tank top, and leggings. I slipped into them with relief, then handed Stephen his shirt. The glow was fading, but I still felt off balance as if something was missing from me. Now what? I asked, though a large part of me would have been more than willing to just lay there for a week. It was a pleasant area. We probably need to go back and face the music, or at least deal with the ramifications. Stephen heaved a sigh. Oh, do you think sidestep still works? Can you do that? Probably. That was always easy for me. Just easier to let Carolyn do the hard work. Let me check the cost. If it was as low as usual, I could do it with a simple offering of a nail. It would hurt, but they grew back. I didn't feel like I could lose more blood right now. I reached for magic, picturing our entry point in Hamadia's house, and nothing. That shook me out of my lethargy a bit. I sat up and reached again. Magic did not respond. I fell back to something that was simple and easy. Fire. Just a simple flame on my palm. Again, magic didn't seem to hear me. Stephen, can you do magic? I asked, unsure of anything at that moment. Me? I nodded at him. Um. He looked at the water we'd been drinking, and nothing happened. Okay, that's odd. N let me try this. This time the earth rose and created a little table. His head tilted, and he focused on something for a minute. I could see and feel things happening, but I wasn't sure what was going on. That is... odd. I have access to order. All of it. And if I had to guess, I'm strong in all classes, but the others are gone. Spirit and chaos aren't there for me to use. He said each word as if feeling it out. I've never had access to transform, and now I do. Okay, I said slowly as I thought. Corey, he snapped, his voice urgent. Look at me. Surprised, I turned to look at him. He'd been on my left side. Now he reached out, grabbing my chin between his thumb and forefinger, and turned my face all the way so my right temple was facing him. He let go and ran a finger over my temple. Your tattoo is gone. There is nothing there. Not even scars. My fingers trembled as I lifted my hand, running it over the marks that had defined me for so long. I'd always been able to just barely feel them, but now the skin felt smooth and unmarred. I don't have any magic? It was a question. Caroline rumbled a distressed sound. I do not know. Esmir will need to look at you. I do not know how to travel without the realms. Neither does she... Sidestepping was a human thing. Stephen frowned. I thought you could travel to the house directly. A tail snapped in response. Yes, but I'd still stepped through the realms. If I knew where I was going, I didn't need to stop at the crossroads. But even that isn't working. I have zero access to the realms as a whole, so I can't open anything. The words changed my worldview. I tried to talk to Carolyn mentally but they were just thoughts in my head. I can't talk to you via mind speak anymore. My heart rate climbed. Am I going to lose you? 
If I'm not a mage, I don't need a focus. Carolyn, will I lose you? My voice hit a high note as I began to shake, everything crashing in on me. First Indira, then Tursane, Salstra, and Bob. Now if I lost him... Nausea rose in my gorge, and I fought to not throw up what I'd just managed to get down. Corey, you will never lose me. Ever. You are my queen, mage or not. You are mine. His strong, fierce voice pounded in my head, and I forced myself to breathe in and out in a slow, steady manner. Magic doesn't matter to me. You are my queen. I kept breathing even as I leaned back on him. Can you get us home, Stephen? I don't know how. I'll figure it out. You did good, Corey, he said, his voice reassuring, if as broken as my heart felt. There in the sun on a strange piece of land, I laid down my head on Carolyn's warm body and closed my eyes. My family was okay. Carolyn was okay. With a little sleep, I could figure out the rest. I let exhaustion pull me down into a deep slumber. Epilogue A memorial for those lost because of the rips has been slated to be installed in D.C. They have contacted the renowned sculptor Merlin Jackson Vinci to create the artwork. The names of those lost will be engraved into the art. The first round of sketches is due in three months where the committee will vote on them. The final three sketches are scheduled to be presented in a public voting system. Their intention is to honor those lost while celebrating the new status quo of magic in our lives. Talking Head on CNN It took two days for us to get off that piece of land. We explored the area, but it was bigger than we could walk. The FBI was able to pinpoint our location, and a U.S. naval ship picked us up and took us to Australia, the closest point of land. One long flight later, though we both got first class, we returned home to a world that seemed more alien than the realms. I spent two weeks in meetings with the OMO, the Senate, the President, the UN, and even all the governors of the states. We went through my memories of Shira and what we face now. There had once been a theory that the moon had been part of Earth, because the geologists felt like we had been bigger ones. He wasn't wrong. But we'd become smaller, not millions of years ago, but about five to 6,000 years ago. It turned out when Zenobia separated the realms, she'd ripped the Earth apart. This was where so many of the flood and world-ending stories came from as the Earth tried to reassemble itself. This time, it had been the opposite. While there were worldwide earthquakes, everything kind of fit in, and the death toll had only been in the thousands, not billions, which allowed me to sleep at night. But it had stopped all the rips, though now all of us were in the same place. They were still mapping everything, and trying to figure out the ramifications. It took a month for the satellites to remap everything. It turned out that the Earth added something like a thousand miles at the equator. Clashes were occurring between the new areas and the existing countries. The denizens were fiercely defending their borders, and our world watched all of it with a mixed sense of horror and fascination. The oceans had merged with the seas and the realms, that meant some of the monsters we talked about in our legend showed up. Those creatures were in an all-out war with our navies. The majority were not sentient, so it made it easier to agree to hunt them. But they weren't easy prey. It turned out Atlantis had existed in the North Atlantic Ocean about 900 miles from the Strait of Gibraltar. The buildings that had once existed were at the same level as our ancient ruins, Atlantis was the size of Maryland and contained at least 35,000 square miles of untouched land. Several sentient denizens elected to move there. The United Nations declared it sovereign territory of the magical beings, mainly because Smog made it crystal clear that if they didn't, every airplane in the world would become fair game 
and the dragons had no issues eating humans. The dragons' favorite areas were part of South America and Africa, and no one even blinked at their claiming of the areas. Luckily for everyone involved, the lands they loved were inhospitable for humans, to say the least. The AIN still had their walls. The denizens could still create pocket realms, but most of them had collapsed. Hamadia's grove materialized in the middle of our street, the land itself shifting and moving. Now, instead of a street with four houses on it, it was a grove with a road circling it with driveways to each house. This had happened around the world with various degrees of acceptance from the residents already there. Then there was the issue with magic. Everyone was a mage, but there were no more Merlins. Everyone had full access to one of the branches, spirit, order, chaos. But that was it. The big change was how much power they had. It was as if magic had paid attention to the problems of humans. Those with limited understanding, the disabled, the damaged, they never rose past hedge mage. They could do simple magics at high prices. The more you studied, the greater your understanding of the mysteries of the universe, the stronger your magic. Someone at archmage levels had strongs in everything. The drama that change caused fueled laughter and nightmares. Laws across the globe were being rewritten. People lost their elected positions. Freedom from magic completely collapsed. Mages still emerged at the end of puberty for the majority of people. The Omo had a field day with retesting, new tattoos, and new ways of measuring abilities. And I was the only adult they could find that had zero magic. I still didn't know if that was a blessing or a curse. The crossroads was gone, so teleporting or sidestepping was the only option left, which annoyed Esmir to no end, but all spirit mages had the ability, which meant all the spirit denizens also had that ability. Stenia, Tursane's sister, agreed to bring Esmir to see us after everything settled down, and I was home. Kuri? Esmir's voice pinged in my mind, and I smiled, rising from my chair in my study. Up here, Esmir. Soft thumps as Esmir came bounding up the stairs and into the study. Amber eyes in emerald fur raked over me, and the tension dropped out of her. You look much better than last I saw you. She rubbed her face against me, her tail relaxed as a purr rumbled out of her body. Two months of no magic, getting regular meals, and sleep helped. Caroline has been making sure no one stressed me too much. I rubbed her ears, just as glad to see her. All of the things I missed about magic, it was the inability to see people that affected me the most. But there wasn't any easy way to travel globally right now. I foresaw a few more years of turmoil before we gained a new equilibrium. I still didn't know how I felt about not being in the middle of it. Excellent. Are you up to visitors? She asked, eyes closed, leaning into my attentions. Besides you? Sure. I didn't know who else would visit me. The publicity of me being the only adult without magic after being the most powerful had created an odd backlash. Now everyone felt sorry for me, and I'd been receiving presents from all over the world, though not from my fan club, thankfully. Even Shishi had sent me a present via post, and Tiatang had told me of his frustration to be unable to come see me, but he wasn't of spirit, so that option wasn't available. They had released me from my draft as I wasn't eligible, though they looked very annoyed at being unable to charge me with anything but the laws weren't written for my situation. They never were. Come, we are in the back. It was almost August, and the days were hot and muggy, but Hamadia now claimed the entire street as her grove. It let her control the temperature to a certain extent, and no one could get near her that wasn't approved. That ability helped shelter me from all the attention and even death threats, Lots of people were not happy about the changes, and my participation in it had been widely advertised. 
Stephen had retired the moment we returned. The second they let him go, he'd claimed Indira's body and disappeared. He'd sent me an email letting me know he wasn't mad, but he couldn't return. I replied letting him know he always had family here. All these thoughts went through my mind as I headed downstairs and out through the sunroom where I stopped in surprise. Carolyn at my back. There were a cluster of beans on my lawn. Hamadia watched them warily from the edge of the house, her dark brown skin and thick bark telling me she was uncomfortable. I recognized Freya and Frey, Sharissa, Smog, and others. In fact, if I had thought about it, the Council of Lords stood on my back lawn. Even Shay and Seat Lolly were there. Though I'd talked to them regularly over the last two months since phones still worked fine, Seat Lolly was well on her way to being a good friend, and Kessis could sidestep, dragging Seat Lolly with her. Hi, I said, unaccountably nervous. Carolyn crowded closer to me, and his weight and heat against my leg let me center myself. For the first time, the fact that I had no magic slammed in on me. I was more helpless than most. Freya stepped forward to meet me. Koi, you are looking well, she said with a smile. We have been worried seeing the images of you that were shared among us. I ran my hands over my head, a bit self-conscious. My hair was almost two inches long, and I'd put on some weight, though I was taking it slow to make sure I gained muscle, not fat. Thank you. So, I have to ask, what brought everyone here? We have a request to ask of you, Smog said in her normal, blunt way. We do not feel anyone else would be as suited as you. There was a general murmur of agreement, and I sighed. I'm not a mage. Definitely not a Merlin. Almost anyone on Earth would be more suited to anything you might need. Not this, Seat Lolly said. They asked us, and we agreed. You are the one person who would excel in this task. I'm missing something, I said. Let's sit, and you can talk to me. It took a few minutes to get everyone situated, with Hamadia making chairs out of the soil. I did love her comfortable creations, though I grabbed a blanket. There were more insects on earth than had existed in her glade. Once everyone was settled, even Zmog looked comfortable, I waved my hand. Okay, Spill, what is this all about? You know about the lands and the rearranging of territories on earth, Freya started, watching me closely. Yes, I've been following that. I managed to close my mouth and not say anything else, no matter how much I wanted to, either apologize or assure them I had no idea what would happen. We are being approached by multiple governments all over the world. Everyone has different demands or questions or offers, and we are struggling to make sense of them all. Tursane had always been the best at doing that, and we miss her. A pang stabbed through my heart, and I bowed my head. Yes, I miss her as well. Freya nodded. We are working on creating an actual government, though it is challenging, but we do not have the time to work through creation slowly, and situations are heating up in some areas. Others are quiet for now. In many ways, the U.S. and China have been the most lenient, We are not as fortunate as other areas. That information did not surprise me. An entire section of Africa had reappeared. That was Esmir's domain. It turned out Madagascar wasn't an island, but the land between it and the continent had been in the realms. Numerous large islands near Australia, Fiji, and Japan appeared, throwing off politics in those areas. Huge sections of land in the middle of Asia. South America, primarily along the mountains, and Central America appeared complete with the beans that thought they had first say. Too many humans disagreed, thinking they could claim those new resources. The denizens were not shy about making sure they paid for their arrogance. Okay, 
but that doesn't explain why you are here talking to me. I only have some friends and a few governments, not any real influence. I really hoped they didn't think I could swoop in and save them, because I couldn't. That is true, but you have something that almost everyone else lacks, Freya said with a subdued smile. I just arched a brow, waiting. The smirks on Seat Lolly's and Shay's faces didn't make me feel better. You are recognized and respected worldwide. Everyone has heard the story of what you did, the sacrifices you made. You are regarded as someone with honor, someone others respect. I could feel my cheeks flushing, but I watched them waiting for the shoe to drop. Why are humans so wrapped up in politics? Zmog grumbled. We wish for you to be the ambassador for the denizens of the realms to the human governments. They will listen to you. Your focus can translate any language, and we'll provide an aid from spirit for transportation and true sensing. Will you save us once again? Sharp whispers and hissing and multiple deadly glares were directed at Smog, but she ignored all of that, instead choosing to watch me. Me? Your ambassador? That wasn't something I'd expected. And the note of pleading in Smog's voice took me aback. I'd never heard anything even close to that in her tone. Smog is accurate, Koi. Sitlali moved to the front, Kessis at her side. They are being hounded and need someone who will advocate for them. I can't think of anyone better than you. Ambassador? I repeated, but this time weighing it out. Carolyn? I asked, turned to look at him. It would show people how strong my queen is, and if we have an aid from spirit, we could do the search and rescue once you were stronger. They could take us anywhere. His voice was quiet, whispering only in my mind. He needed to stretch himself, but the inability to get away from civilization was gnawing at him. My hand found his head, and I rubbed it, understanding. I'm not going to say yes right now, but I'm not saying no. Who would our aid be, and when would this start? I need at least another month or so to recover. That couldn't be skipped. I needed to work out and eat and get back into shape. At least I could walk between our houses now. That would be me, if you would have me. Georgaz popped in front of me with a flash of fire. I've always traveled via sidestep, and I can sense lies. It would honor me to work with Harold Corey. I snorted. <laughs> I'm not Harold Corey anymore. Would you be able to keep secret anything to do with my job? Georgaz loved to gossip, so that was a valid concern. Of course. He puffed up in indignation, then subsided. Besides, many are discovering the magic of the internet and phones. I am not as needed as before. Georgas landed on a perch Hamadia pulled out for him, his feathers shining and flickering with flames. And you will always be Harold Corey to us. You sacrificed everything for everyone. I shrugged, focusing on the denizens watching me. You trust me to make decisions for all of you? That is what I would be doing, binding you to agreements with my word, signing treaties, forging alliances. The idea terrified and thrilled me. It sounded exciting and so rife with pitfalls. Yes, Freya was confident, and I saw no doubt in anyone. You have always been honest and done what you could for the best of everyone. We have no doubts you will do what is best for us not humans. I laughed and shook my head. <laughs> uh, then, yes, I will do this. But not for a few months. The tension faded from Freya. Ah, oh, that is fine. We need to finalize our governments and have our leadership. When that is done, we will let you know. But for now, we can let other nations know we have an ambassador. Corey Monroe. There was a muted cheer, and I just shook my head. 
So much for my life of peace and boredom. But then, my luck always was twisted. Appendix. Magic Symbols. Chaos Symbol. Contains Entropy, Fire, Water, Time. Order Symbol. Contains Pattern, Air, Earth, Transform. Spirit Symbol. Contains Soul, Relativity, Non-Organic, Psychic. To view graphics of symbols, visit badashpublishing.com. Author's Notes Well, it's done. That was the last of Corey's story, I think. I know I have some novellas about life with Carolyn, and I can't say she won't show up in other stories down the road, but now she is the only person on Earth with no magic. A few things slipped in, but people won't realize this until decades have passed. Things like no more disabled children, no more dementia, lots of cancers will fade away, Little things. All the damage that crept in without magic to renew cells and ensure health. But there will be more stories in the Turnian universe. Currently, I'm working on a Mage Hunter book, and I have another trilogy set in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I'm looking forward to. I'm also working on an epic fantasy that I hope you love. Other than that, all I can do is promise more stories. See you on the next newsletter. Mel. Remember, you can sign up for my newsletter at www.badashpublishing.com forward slash newsletter. About the author. Tired of stories that didn't fill her needs, Mel Todd decided to share the weird worlds that occupy her mind. Action, magic, sci-fi, and more. Her stories have it all. You can follow her on Facebook at facebook.com badashbooks. You can also sign up for her newsletter and follow her blog at badashpublishing.com. Author of over 44 stories, you should check out her other worlds. You never know what might grab you. This has been a production of Balanced Luck, book eight of the Twisted Luck series. Written by Mel Todd. Narrated by Autumn Juliet. Copyright 2023, Melissa Todd. Production copyright 2023 by Autumnal Audio.